OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, it is bang on half past seven. You're very welcome along. It is, I think, Tuesday morning, I want to say. Am I correct? Yes, well, it's uh, that week of Christmas week where um, I saw a comedy club yesterday saying, I'm really looking forward to the period where it's F it, it's Christmas. Oh, chocolate for breakfast, F it, it's Christmas. Oh, I can't really go day drinking, F it, it's Christmas. I think we're there, right? That's Someone mm-hmm. on Twitter was pointing out yesterday that there was an old man in a, in a shop in Dublin yesterday giving out about how early they're putting the Christmas decorations up. I saw that. Up. It was the 17th <laughs> of December. I mean, literally. I mean, maybe yeah, as someone pointed out, maybe it's for next year they're <coughs> putting them up already, so maybe he has a point. This is the only time of year where I go by dates and not days. Yeah. I.e. I meet on the 22nd, not Thursday. And so what, what date is today, Colin? Without looking Day down. is it's too early for the dates yet. Oh. It starts on the twenty second. Uh, oh. Yeah. And, and how do you know today's not the twenty second? When is the twenty second? Well I do know the dates, like but that's because of professional reasons. Well you but just look down at the, at so, the yeah, little well, yeah, So we saw that, you know. We're but um you know, I'm just saying socially I would go by dates and not days when I if I wanted to meet someone. I think moment. because Christmas Day is on a Sunday this year, I think it makes more sense in our heads. Because then the twenty sixth is a Monday, it feels like a Monday. Bank holiday. It's a good thing that Christmas is on a Sunday, isn't it? Isn't it an extra bank holiday? Don't know. The 27th is... Yeah. Yeah, Jojo's nodding here. So it's a good thing, isn't it? But then it feels like the run-up, it takes forever. Does it? Yeah, because I feel like when when there's a midweek Christmas day, there's a bit more party feel for longer. But now it's because, like, this just very much feels like a Tuesday to me. Oh, it doesn't feel like Christmas? I don't think so, not yet. But I I was saying yesterday... Do you know why it feels like a Tuesday? In a meeting, that tomorrow will start... (laughs) Tomorrow is going to be the first day of Christmas because a lot of people will finish up work today. Go on. Tomorrow, right. tomorrow, it feels like a Tuesday but, uh, because it is a Tuesday, but the, tomorrow is the shortest day of the year, isn't it? Yeah. yeah there you go. It is, yeah. New Grange. It's all, it's all grand stretch from there. Let me tell you. you you'd, you'd, be into your, you'd be into your New Grange and Solstice and stuff, Shane, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, well, you're wearing a NASA jumper this morning. so uh, it's for you. It's happy birthday. Both of us. Thank you very much. It's not my birthday for, for a while, but, but I'll take it. Um... Uh, yeah, I'd be into the winter solstice. I've never been to New Grange for the for the shortest day. Of the Didn't year. get the invite. Now tickets are tough to get. Are they? I, are they? I, I mean, I've never tried. It's also like you have to be up. You have to be up pretty early, right? Although uh, maybe you don't. Maybe. Well, like, when, the, when the sun comes up. When I was when I was younger, I might have felt oh, you got to be up early. But I think like the sun's coming up about half seven or something. Is it? So it's not that early. Yeah, but I think you'd be there from four o'clock. Yeah, you have to prep. You have to be there for sure and, and get, get locked into in the, into the darkness, into the passageway. I'd say it's a mass, magical moment. Oh, yeah. Reading in the years 1999 showed Bertie as one of the invitees to go in the turn of the century to Newgrange. I just remember him ducking in. Did you ever go there? Never I, been to Newgrange. It's quite nice. No, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it because it's on my way home, essentially. Yeah, it's very close to you. Yeah, just off the M1. So. Very nice. Did my, uh, did my J1 in San Francisco and didn't make it to the Golden Gate Bridge, so I, oh, wouldn't, wow. I wouldn't, feel, wouldn't feel too bad about that. I mean, I, there's loads of the best uh, Irish tourism things that I've never done. What's I mean, the, what's you're the not worst? supposed to. Well, that that knock on Newgrange is pretty bad. I mean, I I have seen the Book of Kells, which, but only because I went as a teenager. Yeah, you don't do your own things, I suppose. No, have you seen the Book of Kells? Never. Yeah, I have. Uh, no, um, you're you're, you're like a a Dublin culture, culture. so maybe you would come up to Dublin and be like, oh wow, look, I have yeah. to do all the things. Uh, well, I suppose yeah, I suppose technically I am according to you, but <clears> no, I wouldn't say I am. But I've never done. Um, I've never kissed the Brandy Stone, for example. Nah. Nah. Well, so, you know, why would you need to? It's very unsanitary, yep. isn't it? Over the, yeah. And you have to lie down backwards. Yeah. It's precarious Jeez. and unhygienic. But I've never done it. Gotta, gotta you yourself, don't do your own things. You don't do your own go things. there, lads. You know, you know. I think you have to. <laughs> have you done it? Yeah, again, as a teenager. You have to be American, do you not, to kiss the Blarney Stone? We had tourists over who, um, I think, uh, my sister's French exchange, and we were like, oh, Jesus, what do you do with these people? You bring them around and you do all the tourist crap that you wouldn't do yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, I kissed the Blarney Stone. That's what you have to sound like to kiss the Blarney Stone, I think. I think it's a rule. If you sound Irish, you actually don't get in. Well, I suppose the other thing is that it's uh, it's clearly like, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just a stone, and you don't actually end up being a better talker after you kiss it. Really? So maybe we don't buy our own shit as much as we, you know, we can't. It's harder to... Possibly, yeah. Come in and jail, I think, is, is our, uh, that's, that's a tourist attraction that a lot of people should go. I haven't, haven't done that. Oh, really? No, no I haven't done that. Definitely one worth, worth taking off. Very, very good tour. Always sold out. Did the Crumlin Road uh, um, Prison of Belfast. That's that's good. Oh, yeah? You should do that, yeah. I must try that one. And the good day uh, out in Belfast. Derry Walls, of course. Haven't done the Derry Walls, no. Nope. Barack Obama Plaza. Did you do Titanic? 
Haven't done Titanic. Titanic's brilliant. Is it good? Is yeah. it? It's very good, yeah, yeah. It's, it's worth seeing. Um, Somebody was giving out about... Um, Giant's Causeway. Somebody was giving out yeah. about Giant's Causeway. That. that was very good. I thought Giant's Causeway was great, but then I was I was a child. See, you're, you've Antrim blood, so you're you're going to say that anyway. Is that uh, a new jumper? Yeah, been to... What? Is that a new jumper? We've already had this conversation. No, but is it actually new? No. Brand new? I, I got it for Electric Picnic. Mm, I remember it, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Picnic. Very nice. Go on, Colm. No, yeah, I just you've had like 45 minutes to think of a good line. I was line. just looking at Dennis Ryan's comments. That was it. Well, what, what's your... What, I see you're going to... Uh, I was distracted by it. That's all. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh. What are we doing, lads? I mean, I think it's. I think Christmas has already started, i got to say. Mm-hmm. Found it hard to get to sleep. Found it hard to get out of bed this morning. Oh. Just finding it like it's Christmas. It has, yeah. Right, yeah I, mean, I, I went to the shops last night and bought um, Bailey's coffee and Bailey's cream. I went to get proper stuff and then I was like, nah, do you know what? I'm going to start it. I'm going to really, really tuck in. You mean you bought Bailey's and you bought coffee, you didn't buy Bailey's coffee. Sorry, I bought Bailey's and I bought Bailey's cream. Yeah, yeah. I bought the ingredients to make Bailey's coffee. And you use Bailey's cream in your Bailey's coffee? Uh, yeah, at the top of it I would, yeah. yeah, yeah right, not yeah, just yeah. normal cream with it? Nah, but I also use the Bailey's over ice just right. by itself. So go on, quickly. Give us your down the barrel of the lens. Yeah. Make your Bailey's coffee for us. Oh, pressure. I have to do this every Christmas. So first of all, you obviously boil the kettle, make the coffee, a uh, nice bit of instant coffee. Um, Jesus, I'm panicking now. Uh, you put some two tablespoons of sugar at the bottom, put the coffee on top, <coughs> maybe put the, the, the shot or two of Bailey's in first, so the, the shot or two of Bailey's on top of the, the sugar. Then the coffee on top of that, and then up to maybe just give enough room for a little head of cream, like a head of Guinness, and uh, obviously to heat your your little teaspoon, and uh, slowly, slowly pour the Bailey's cream on top of it so it doesn't sink in. But um, in in a nice clear glass, presentation is key. Napkin, spoon, little mint if you have it. Um, so I make them for the family on Christmas Day. Mint, it's my job. Ah, no, whatever, whatever you want, whatever you're having yourself. It's controversial. Yeah, uh, maybe controversial. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't actually have a mint. I'm just trying to sound more uh, <laughs> more posh than I am. But uh, yeah, Bailey, that's my Bailey's coffee routine. Uh, no sugar, says Emma. <clears throat> I'd have sugar. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm terrible at making them and it sweetens it up for everyone. Um, maybe I'm thinking of Irish Irish coffees, but no, no. There's uh, something about um, when you're making French coffee, like warming the spoon and pouring the cream down the back of the spoon to make yeah. sure it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> There's but a, I don't know. De- Somebody's going to fix it for us. Yeah, yeah. I used to work in a restaurant and make these, so... <laughs> YouTube.com forward slash off the ball. Subscribe on that. Um, you, yeah. <coughs> and uh, you can also tweet us at off the ball AM. There you go. Sort of wrapping presents yesterday. Already? Yeah. What? Jeez, I don't it's wrap... Christmas week. I wrap on Christmas Eve. Ah, no, but try to travel. So I can't wrap them uh, down there in front of the people. Well, you can wrap but them in I find it uh, quite cathartic like washing dishes. I'm not saying I'm a great rapper now. Not a sellotape jotting out a position. I'd love to be a good rapper of presents. Eminem's a good rapper. Seems like a nice skill to have. Yeah, very good skill. I'd say you'd be all right. No, I'd be brutal. No, I'd say you'd we be actually, good because uh, we're, we're quite environmentally conscious in our house, we, we get oh. old copies of the Northern Standard newspaper. Oh, do you rap And like uh, that? Just, just fired into that. Oh, that's yeah. quite good. Yeah. It's good that uh, 40 years of being cheap is finally um, being recast as uh, eco friendly. Yeah, it's very good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a different title. <laughs> Would you wrap your own presents though for people, Jer? Wrap my own presents for people. Yeah, that you've bought for people. Uh, yeah, of course. Would you? Well, absolutely. Well, you think I was like a little rapper person following me around, going, uh, "Would you like me to wrap your presents for you?" I, I do. I find just couldn't though, see you having <clears throat> the patience to sit down and wrap a present. I do find though that if you like go to a shop and say this is a gift, they might actually wrap it. for Yeah, you. I, I do that. It's I do that a lot. Top, top tip there, Colm. I do that a lot. Yeah. I do ask a lot for that, and you get mixed mixed responses as a result. You hang around for long. Friends are busy there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you don't get you. So you get people to wrap your presents. No, I wrap my own. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just I I just couldn't see it happen. Jesus, Fair play. Mm. I just couldn't, I just couldn't see it happen. Right, uh, let's let's move on. There's some some stuff happening. We should talk about uh, Argentina going home. Oh yes. Oh, I mean they're just they just they can't help themselves. It's coming home. Except it's it's going it's gone home. Ah, brilliant. And then they did it in Spanish in one of the papers as well. Oh, great yeah. photo, great video of some uh, mirror. Was it Irish or English lads in the pub yesterday? And Messi uh, getting his award and one one lad crying in front of his friends. Volviendo a casa. Brilliant. Now that means it's coming home, <coughs> uh, and it, it's it's technically it is home now. But here's uh, our first clip here. Uh, this is Rosario celebrations from Lionel Messi's hometown of Rosario. It's just going to be crazy, isn't it? It's won't been be so a, long. Won't be a goat milked in Rosario for a week. Look at that. 
pure carnage. A month long carnival, really. Jesus. And the, the winter festival, like it's, you know, uh, obviously it's not winter, it's summer. Like it's perfect. Yeah. I was chatting to one of my housemates yesterday who had an Argentinian colleague who, who showed up for work yesterday. Oh, I think I'd probably go do my lap of honour and then go lunchtime. For one day. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I think if Monaghan won the All-Ireland, I'd have to... Jeez, I don't know if I'd be seen for a while. Well, uh, but Maybe I'd come, in, I'd come in the day after for the crack. You miss out. Yeah, You miss true. out on that bit of like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. And then, because, uh, you know... Yeah, and I'd, then, come, I'd come in the Monday. You know, it might not be safe for air. You don't have to worry about it, though. No, it's true. Like <laughs> You had your chance. Harsh. Uh, this is Buenos Aires, from Rosario to Buenos Aires. This is from somebody's balcony, right? Jesus. Um... I mean, that's just... Plaza de la Republica. I was going to ask you. Uh, thanks for the geographical... In your notes there. Stamp. Oh, thank you. The obelisk is the one that um, they were all talking about. Uh, there was a good quote from Maradona about how when you win, they give you the balcony of Casa Rosada, the, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, or Evita, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I actually haven't seen the movie with Madonna in it. Is it any good? I haven't seen it. I thought it was... I, uh, it's one of my first memories. So, so, that. says Jojo. <laughs> He's Brazilian. One though. of your first memories. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's interesting. Yeah. Go on, do you want to tell us any more about that? Is there well, anything Freudian? I just watching it one afternoon. Uh, on your own? The, no, the family, like, but... Right. Uh, well, I wouldn't seek it out on my own, like, I wouldn't have any context for it. It was just put on. Well, maybe you're, like, the world's the, biggest Madonna fan. I don't know. I do appreciate... Do you know, actually, Madonna uh, performed at the Hacienda nightclub in Manchester just before she got famous. Class. There was a recent documentary about the Hacienda and she's there right. and there's a lot of disinterested people looking on being like, oh yeah, whatever. A bit like um, Nirvana performed in Cork a week before Smells Like Teen Spirit dropped. <laughs> there you go. A bit of um, trivia. bit of trivia on your Tuesday morning, folks. Uh, that movie about the Hacienda is very good. 24-hour party people, if you haven't seen it. Oh yeah, that's a different one. It's Steve Coogan one. But this yeah. is actually a documentary in the last month by the BBC with the Madonna footage. Yeah, no, I, both, are, both are excellent. Uh, right, the last one here is uh, celebrations on Sunday night from Foxford in County Mayo, which is um, the birthplace of Argentinian naval hero Admiral William Brown. They needed some reason to celebrate, didn't they? <coughs> well, as we heard, the curse is over, so um, they're free now. All right. Oh yeah. So these are, if you can't, if you're listening on radio or a podcast, it's a bunch of tractors going going through the streets. Where are we here? Foxford. Foxford County Foxford, Mayo. Oh, yeah. Uh, good, good mills in Foxford. Are there any blue tractors? I know the John Deere's, the green and yellow, and Ford. The, the Ford, Ford or the blue, blue one. Sorry, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. It is there. Ah, there's a good one. Bang on cue. Lovely Ford there. Yeah. They're color coded as well. There you go. Oh, brilliant. And the lights there on. There's the Zetters and the Lamborghinis. Yeah. <laughs> That's class. Now these people are remembering their roots, celebrating. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's mad. Like, but they obviously feel some kind of connection to it. Any excuse, lads? Any excuse? Uh, right, do we have a sting for this? Or do we have a... Is there a little bit of... Bit of music column, yeah. isn't there? Is there? Yeah, a bit of music. There you go. Oh. Oh. It's like Oscars. It's like the speech part. Oh, they might play us off, actually. As well. Oh, they're going to yeah, play us off. if we talk too much. Yeah. Not too long. Yeah. So this is our World Cup Awards. Yeah. But not, not awards like any other. Give us your World Cup Awards, folks. Get us 87 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. Who deserves what awards? And don't give me player of the tournament. Don't give me goal of the tournament. Don't give me goalkeeper of the tournament or young player of the tournament. We've had all that nonsense, right? Yeah. What have we got? We don't care about those things anymore. Villain. We've got five five awards to hand out this morning. Um, well, we start with niche moment. Do. Niche moment of the tournament. So I guess this is something that, that happened during the tournament that maybe garnered some headlines at the time, but then people forgot about it because other big things are happening. Um, for me, it's uh, Rafael Varane's big ass from the final. You'll see from the photograph on screen that Varane's arse kept Lautaro Martinez on side in the build-up to Argentina's third goal in the World Cup final on uh, Sunday. So the very margins of the Frenchman, the Manchester United defender's arse, essentially, look at the scoreboard there. Argentina 3, France 2, and that arse is keeping Lautaro Martinez on side. I mean, I thought he was outside by a good bit when they showed you in normal times. Like, oh, that looks well onside. And mm, then mm. about five minutes later, they pop this up, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh, wow, that was close. And the reason why his arse is keeping him onside is because obviously you can't score with your hand. I mean, the rules have become so mm. difficult to. Uh, so it's not a scoring part. And so therefore, but if it had been like, if it had been any yeah. portion of his foot or leg yeah, yeah, yeah. or. 
or his own arse. Yeah, yeah. I think they changed that after the first VAR season because there was too many goals being ruled out for yeah, insignificant yeah, yeah, body parts. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the comments on, on social media on this were, were pretty good. Uh, man needs to chill on those squats. Hand of God versus Varane's ass, says another. Even Francis fans are mad at his ass now. Another reason why... His ass seems bigger than it is in real life, though. It does, yeah. Maybe, like they're kind of, you know... It's well, like um, Botticelli's doing Varane's arse in this as opposed to, you know, his actual... Yeah, well, look, maybe FIFA wanted to, to draw an extra little bit onto Rafa's uh, bum there, but uh, for all intents and purposes... That was my niche moment of the tournament. Raphael's Varan, Raphael Varane's ass uh, essentially ruining the World Cup chances for France. That's pretty good, actually. I think that's, that's going to be the winner here. I, I don't know if this is actually so much a niche moment, but I just have John Harrison's reaction to Gareth Bale's penalty against Canada when he described him as a genius and said he can score whenever he wants in a game where Bale barely touched the ball and was completely ineffective. But I did enjoy the hyperbole by Harrison. It's also a great penalty. Uh, I, did, I did forget about Wales being in the World Cup. I mean, this is the first time I've thought about Wales being in the World yeah. Cup since they went out. I have another Wales input later on, but oh, right. that was my, that was my <coughs> niche one. And then I, well, I couldn't sit it between that and then Marquinhos' very dramatic drop to his knees when he hits the post against uh, Croatia. But again, it's not really that niche. It was quite recent and memorable, but it was amazing that clang of the post, the sudden, the momentary pause, and the sudden fall to the knees as Brazil get knocked out. Yes. I love that. But I'll go for Bale because it's more niche. Okay. Yeah, it's the. Two pretty niche picks, I think. Uh, Bobby Dwyer has been in touch. Hello, Bobby. It's been a while. As delicious as Bailey's coffee is, can we get back to the Premier League? As it's back in six days, we will talk Premier League. Plenty of time. I'll just yeah. to talk Premier League. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we're not ready. You, you were like basically in tears when we talked about oh, it earlier. Someone brought it up in the meeting, and I was like, no, please, please. Yeah. League Cup tonight. Uh, just yeah. no. Like I can't. It's only it's Tuesday morning, and the greatest World Cup final ever was on Sunday afternoon. Imagine those scenes in Mayo, says Powell seventy four. The Buenos Aires scenes. I mean, like, I kind of want to see it now, in a way. Yeah, I'd love to see it. That would be our equivalent. Yeah, would it be yeah. them winning. Yeah. Where would it be? Castle Bar? It'd be, it would be virtual. Uh, it would be all over. Yeah. It would be hard not to go down there. And there would, scenes would be the same in, in Ackle and in Westport and in Foxford and in Ballina. Mm. Maybe we'll live to see it. I, maybe I, I'll live to see it, but. They're not that far away. No, it's true. Yeah, 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 it's true. They just hadn't scored those two own goals in that one game. Yeah, maybe Kevin McStay is the man to bring it back. Do you want to pick the winner per category or at the end? Oh, uh, Varane's arse, one nil. That's good. <laughs> I'll take it. That's very good. Um, I'm keeping score here, by the way. Ding, one nil. Okay. Very good. The next award in our uh, different awards for the World Cup is the biggest choke of the tournament. For me, there was only one winner here. If you're the captain, if you're the leader, you have to, in a penalty shootout, step up and take a penalty for your country first. Don't put yourself fifth and uh, in the want of glory and the headlines and the newspaper cuttings. Don't put yourself fifth. Don't be that guy. And Neymar, I'm talking, I'm talking right to you right now, right down the lens. I hope you're watching. You're a coward. It was a very cowardly act. You're there for your country at a World Cup. Jojo's, yeah. And look, Brazil get to a, a penalty shootout. They go out on a penalty shootout, and, and who's to blame? Who was the hero in that game before, before the penalties? Oh, yeah. Neymar, what a goal. What, what a moment. And he ruins it. We saw it on Sunday in the World Cup final. Mbappe steps up first. Messi steps up first. Dispatch their penalty. Set the tone in the shootout for the rest of your team. And just drop the mic and say, there you go. Now you go you do your job. I've done mine. Do, do what I just did. But Neymar's like, okay guys, make sure you all score now so I can, I can score the winner and and win this thing and be the hero no biggest choker of the whole tournament was Neymar just uh, couldn't keep my eyes off Jojo there our Sao Paulo native in the production box nodding furiously along there to Shane's entry that Neymar choked he did stage. now Tim Vickery did say uh, Brazilian people can be very cruel on their own so is, is it going the other side where they're completely blaming Neymar for this I mean sure. he deserves it with respect uh, all people can be pretty cruel absolutely to their own I don't think it's a uh, well, I'm, I'm telling you what Tim Vickery said. I know, I, I know, but I'm also I'm just disagreeing with what Tim Vickery said because, like, we we do it. England does oh, it, of course. France does it. Pointed out, Belgium do it. S some people will point out, oh, going fifth, putting yourself down as fifth is actually really brave because that could be that could be the winning penalty. It could be the most pressurised kick. Could be, of the could be. There's a possibility of it. I would argue the opposite. It, you're actually you're actually going. I'm so afraid. I'm such a choker that I'm going to put myself fifth on the off chance that I might not have to kick one. Mm. I might win 3-1 on penalties, 4-2 on penalties. I might not, might not have to kick one here. So um, there, I don't think there's any argument here that Neymar is the, the choker of the Guitar World Cup. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. 
Rodrigo like, first. Yeah, that shootout was madness. Madness. <laughs> I went for uh, also a penalty, kind of a World Cup of penalties, wasn't it? Mm. So Harry Kane steps up against France, scores the first, no problem at all. 84 minutes hits the clock. I'm in a pub in Dublin. I have a dinner reservation for nine o'clock. Please, Harry, score. Please, Harry, miss was my conundrum. I went for the latter because I didn't want to watch the extra time of penalties on my phone in a restaurant. So when I say choke here, I actually mean the hero of the tournament for me was Harry Kane very selflessly missing that penalty so that I could watch the rest of that game and then go to the restaurant afterwards, knowing that the match was over and France were through. But what a moment, what a moment. Like England were very, very good against France. What an opportunity to get to the semi-final. They had a better squad this time around than they did in 2018. They could have gone all the way here. Harry Kane, England's best player, penalty taker supreme, against his club teammate, absolutely balloons it over the bar. You will not see a bigger choke because the difference there is that Kane actually did take the penalty, whereas Neymar didn't. And that's what happened. He ballooned it. That was like Mike Bassett, England manager, ballooned over the bar. And apparently the ball hit a, a kid's face. Ah, crying as a result. Harry. Ah, no. Yeah. Read that last night in a I bit of research. A bit of research. Believe. And I've forgot, already forgotten fact is the ball smacked the kid's face. No, I don't have it. Oh, yeah. Not having it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So trying trying to get choke. some sympathy for someone where I don't know. That no. is the big, no. That's the definition of a choke, really, <coughs> is you step up to take penalty to win it, and you miss. Equaliser, one all. Yeah. I'm, going with, I'm going with that. Because I, I think Neymar scored an amazing goal, and, and like, you know, I, I do think that uh, maybe the rest of the team also choked and missed those penalties. Look, I, I did argue fervently for Neymar, but I, I do think Harry Kane choked the life out of it as well. So uh, I'll give you that one, Colm. To be fair, Thanks, uh, the next award is uh, personality of the World Cup. This, this is a fairly wide-ranging genre, but for me, there was only one winner, and he was a Dutchman. He was the manager, former Manchester United boss. He's picked up many accolades across his managerial career. It's Louis Van Gaal. Um, from the moment he stepped set foot in Qatar, I think people fell in love with him. Uh, of course, he's battled his illness. He's had uh, a tough time of it in recent uh, months, Louis Van Gaal, but. He had the, uh, the press conference where a young Dutch journalist just wanted to say nice things to him and Van Hal gives him a lovely hug at the end. Everyone's like, oh, journalistic integrity out the window. What's he doing hugging a football manager? Forget about it. Let Van Hal hug who he wants. Forget it. There was another press conference with Memphis Depay where uh, he was asked about the fact that, you know, he used to, you never really played Memphis Depay when he played at United. And he was like, well, now we get on very well. We kiss each other on the lips. And that's a look to the, the press corps as he said it with menace in his eyes, as is most things with Van Hal. There was the moment when the Dutch players came home, was it after the last 16 win against the USA, USA possibly, yeah. where they're all coming into the hotel and, and all the, the hotel workers are uh, welcoming them home with music and a bit of fanfare and, and dancing and Van Hal is filming like a granny at an Irish wedding with the with the phone out. It probably was a flip phone, maybe a Nokia. Um, but there was that moment. And then uh, the, the one that topped it off for me was, was the Argentina antics where Messi is almost squaring up to, to Van Hal and shouting things at him in the in the dugout and the other Argentina players are hopping on board and Van Hal's just staring at him confused as if he's uh, the world's most innocent man. Um, for me, for a number of reasons and across, it seemed to be every couple of days a story came out about Louis Van Hal that made me love him even more. So Louis Van Hal for me, personality of the tournament. Uh, I can't argue with this, really. I can't compete with it. I saw this entry before I went on air and I was like, yeah, I love Louis. I love Louis for his two years at United, even though it wasn't that mm. successful. I just love Louis Van Hal. He's a great personality. He's been through a lot as well in his personal Did you not life. even show up to this entry? If you're not in, you can't win. Hold on now, a second. I have an entry. Okay. <laughs> at least I entered. Go on. Oh. Um, I have Emmy Martinez for the opposite reason, that he was a, such a complete bastard for the whole tournament and he was entertaining from start to finish and Pete at the time when the entire world was watching him be a complete bastard. That was amazing, like absolutely amazing. So obviously the, the <laughs> trophy ceremony when he got his own individual award, we'll never forget that. What he just did to the France penalty takers, Philippe Ocler was in the show saying was a terrible thing to do. And uh, okay, fair enough, but I thought it was just brilliant entertainment. So complete bastard, total opposite end to Van Hal, who I love. Martinez complete bastard. I also have an honorable mention to the Senegal fans in general who brought um, so much joy, like every time I watched them, I just got about 5% happier. Have you seen that Senegal. footage of Samuel Eto'o going mad? Yeah, I actually did consider... Um, it was mad, in. wasn't it? That was mental. Like, yeah. it stops and then... Chase, he chase. It looks like he's done. It looks like the, the, the situation has uh, been solved, like. Yeah. And then, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did consider entering that, but I went a little little bit more wholesome. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll go Emmy Martinez as my number one choice there for personality. See, I want to give it to Emmy Martinez because I'm a Villa fan, but... 
was going to say if, if, you, if, if, if Colin gets I, this, I, 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 I cook in the books there I'd prefer to I prefer to give it to Louis to be honest I think it's um, a better shout you're bowing to Louis I bow to Louis I love Louis yeah, yeah. I thought the Villa fan was going to hand it over and okay, it's going to be I'm, I'm adjudicating that to be a draw it's 2 all. Okay, two. we'll take it we'll take it to be fair Emmy deserves it as well like Emmy Martinez they were booing me what else was I going to do you know <laughs> okay fair enough I'm with you yeah. you, you had me uh, three games ago you had me in the Dutch game and uh, I'm with you for life. Although his agents in the paper today going, yeah, he wants to play Champions League. Of course he does. Uh, Germany, yeah, no problem. Spain, absolutely. Italy, of course. I'm like, shut up, mm. shut up, shut up, <laughs> shut up. Yeah, fair. give us at least two <laughs> days. We're being, we're being, we're being sang off here by the music. Uh, the right. next, the next award is the uh, the worst sports washing award. The uh, award. There were plenty of moments across the tournament where you're like, ah, that leaves a, a bit of a sour taste in the mouth across the entire tournament. For me, it was. Every single game when Gianni Infantino pops on screen for, uh, you know, the, the quick five, ten seconds, said that at the start of the tournament there was those moments where seemed to be booed in the stadiums and then all of a sudden we're hearing from the journalists on the ground in the stadiums that uh, all of a sudden those images weren't on screen in the stadiums anymore. Um, it seemed to happen between like 50 seconds and a minute and a half into the match, like clockwork. So for me that left a, a bit of a strange taste in the mouth, making it all about himself. So for me, Gianni Infantino was the, the villain of the tournament and also it was the uh, sports washing moment of the tournament him Yeah, I have the same I just have his uh, pre-tournament infamous now infamous monologue there the eve of the tournament so whatever Infantino uh, moment there you'd prefer to choose I, Okay, I, I mean all, uh, up to like trying to steal the trophy at the end and not getting off stage like it was um, you know being it's all about me uh, mm. so yeah again the draw is that it? are we done? Today one more I feel selfish so that, that that's the uh, the second last the penultimate award as they, as they say, the last award then in our uh, awards is the fan interaction award. For me, I've got a, a quick clip of the Saudi Arabia, of course, beating Argentina, the shock of the tournament in the opening game or the opening game for Argentina. They uh, went on to do better things, of course. Uh, and this Saudi Arabia fan chatting to I think it was a Japanese reporter, um, uh, feeling quite confident and happy after his Saudi team had beaten Argentina. Have a look. 말 그대로 루사이드의 기적이었습니다. 극적인 승리를 차지한 사우디 팬들은 경기가 끝나고도 기쁨을 만끽했습니다. I mean, wow. The where is Messi fan? It is amazing, right? Because um, uh, was it, it wasn't the Argentine uh, FA, Argentine FA who released uh, Where's Messi and then had the uh, like, rest of the World Cup. Um, it's pretty amazing. Like The very same fan was stopped uh, walking into the final by, I think, a Mexican channel wearing an Argentina jersey. <laughs> he had come full circle. I mean, he, he'd probably become so famous in Argentina that he was like, I'm going to lean into this and ah, become that guy. So I, I mean, I, like, he will meet Messi on telly oh, it'll be so in Argentina it. in a game show. Yeah. There'll be like a, I mean, Maradona hosted a game show in, in Argentina for, I think, a couple of years. And uh, you know at some point that the prize is going to be him. Oh, yeah. Here ah. is Me- Where is Messi? Here is Messi. Yeah. Right. Behind the curve. Who have you got? Wales get knocked out by Iran in the World Cup, and a Sky reporter approaches the Wales fans afterwards. Oh. Here it is. Guys, sorry, you're live on Sky News. Your reaction to the win? Uh, we lost. Sorry, reaction to the loss, and apologies. Give a this season. Reaction to the loss? Uh, shit. Apologies for the language. <laughs> In the background, give it to Giggs at the end of the season. Yeah. <laughs> I missed that. He's had a mare on a number of fronts there, actually. Oh, oh it's like, how long is the clip? Is it six seconds? Yeah. Ten seconds? And that's how much happens in ten seconds. It's Three amazing things. With content. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. And the give fan, it to Giggs at the end of the season. Yeah. Uh, the fans' comic timing Shit. for the first oh. one is, uh, the, the first one, <laughs> we lost. Yeah. It's so, it's, it's like he had yeah, to prepare about the win. We lost. we lost. So that has to be the best oh. fan interaction. That's, uh, sorry, the winner, winner, chicken. Dinner. Fair play. I can't take it away from you there. Billy is the winner. Eight o'clock this morning. If you want to get involved, oh uh, eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. Of course, you can also leave a comment in the YouTube stream. Now, a reminder: Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. The festive season is officially here, so why not enjoy a shot of gingerbread goodness in your Braeburn Coffee today? It's available at Apple Green locations nationwide. Now, we're turning our attention to Camogie, and I'm delighted to say Sarsfield's All Ireland Senior Camogie Championship winning captain Neve McGrath is with us. Neve, good morning to you. How are you? 
Hi, good morning. Good, great. <laughs> Can't complain now. Um, the benefits of winning on a Saturday means that officially the Monday club is actually a Sunday club. So how are you, is, has everything calmed down? Are you all... Uh, <laughs> there's a few, yeah, I, there's a few days club now, if you don't be honest. <laughs> uh, so a bit tired this morning, but uh, it's great. Like everyone's kind of in celib- celebratory mode anyway with the Christmas. So uh, any excuse. <laughs> so um, to win one All-Ireland in one year is uh, fairly remarkable. To win two in the same year is ridiculous. Uh, what like what level of celebrations do you get to at this point? Uh, like it was unbelievable anyway, it kind of... Um, like to achieve it in the calendar year was unbelievable and the celebrations were probably it was the sweetest one yet because of the amount of injuries we had and the caliber of players we were missing and who we managed to still eke it out so ah yeah like it's unbelievable it's kind of hard to take it all in at the moment it's been a whirlwind the last couple of days but um so privileged and lucky to be in the position we are in when did you did you come straight home after the game was there a homecoming that night yeah, we did actually. We uh, weren't home till around 12 or nearly one o'clock, I think it was. So it was late enough, but there was still um, a very big crowd in Ballyfaya to meet us. So delighted to see that. And then um, we started early Saturday, or Sunday and we were watching the Valley Ale and the Thompson match and the World Cup. So it was great to Sunday <laughs> in Ballyfaya all day. So, yeah. It's a real family affair for you as well, Neve, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, dad's over us, and then um, there's four sisters involved, and yeah, but like that, it's not just us. There's, there's Kellys, there's Kennys, there's Wars, there's Gallagher's. It's like a stereotypical Royal GA club. We're all related, cousins, friends, grew up together. So yeah, kind of ticks that box. Yeah, you say it's a stereotypical rural GA club, but it's a stereotypical All Ireland uh, harvesting GA yeah. club. When your dad's generation were there, it was the men who were routinely talked about as uh, potential All Ireland champions and multiple All Ireland champions, and now it's the women. Uh, what 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 is it in the what's in the water? I I honestly don't know, but um, it's probably there's not much else going on to be totally honest. I mean, you either play GA or you know there's not really many other options where we live, but um. It's just, it's nice and it's kind of um, just extra nice the fact there's so much um, fathers and daughters involved in 93, 94. I think we were saying last year there was 10 direct links between fathers and daughters of those on the 93, 94 All-Ireland winning teams and those on the, the our teams, so to speak. And that's not even counting uncles and cousins or relations. So it's just nice, like, um, especially like it's fathers and daughters as opposed to fathers and sons. It's kind of a nice... Uh, other uh, spin on it. Does it matter, like, in a way, I, I, sorry, obviously it matters, right, but how much does it matter, I wonder, that they were so successful, that they that actually winning in All-Ireland was something that wasn't, that didn't just happen in other clubs, that actually Sarsfields is a club that understands what it takes to compete at the very top level, and so when your dads are talking to you as kids, and when you were growing up as kids, you're like, there's All-Ireland medals in the house, do you know it's not yeah no it actually there's a great tradition and I do think um that counts for something when you're trying to get over the line I mean and we were going up like I was probably too young to remember it but all the talk you'd be going to your dad's matches and I remember going up on the train when they lost to Burr in the All-Ireland in 98 and that was so exciting for me and it stuck with me and even when they were kind of coming towards the ladder into their careers and they were playing Athen Ryan County Finals and we'd all be going in on buses and we'd all be in Iggy Daly's pub and after my afterwards and uh, just great occasions and yeah no it definitely had some kind of an influence <laughs> It must be so special Neve, as well for it to be Croke Park like to be to be playing on that pitch that as you said that you used to go up and down on the train or whatever to watch matches that must add to it as well Ah uh, yeah like it's absolutely brilliant and it's it's great the fact now that the LGFA and Camogie finals are there and um, it really is such a reward to get there with your club and it's special and it takes a few minutes to take it all in the first time we went up it's kind of surreal but um, we've been there four times now and we, it's, we're so lucky and it's it's brilliant it's extra special than winning on Pro Park so, yeah. what's, what's it about this generation of, of girls in that team then because like the, the, the team goes from not winning anything to all of a sudden being expected to win the All Ireland every year, essentially, or, or to certainly be in contention, like it's, it's really gone from from famine to feast. Yeah, it is. I mean, like I'm the oldest on the panel anyway, or not the team, and it was kind of uh, we won All Ireland Fatal title in 2007, and from that team was about five or six of us that kind of kickstarted everything, and we won our first um, senior championship 2016. 
Um, and from there, underage talent has come through and we've won a numerous under 16s minors down through the year. So it's kind of just a, a good spell in the club's period, like, and it won't last forever, obviously not, like, especially given the fact we're such a kind of small area. But um, we're going to our glory years now at the moment. So we want to try and capitalize on it as much as we can while we can, because we're well aware it won't last and it's short lived in the grand scheme of things. How do you keep the motivation up year on year? Like, is it a case of coming back and, and maybe playing different opposition? Even, like, the fact that you were, it was a level at half time, and then you go a point behind um, not long after half time at the weekend. So, like, that sort of game, when it's close like that, I, I'm sure it adds the uh, the intrigue to the following year then as well. Ah, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, first of all, it's kind of so hard to uh, go away. The competition is stiff, and each and every year it's so tough. I mean, we only won the semi final and final by two points. So, uh, the motivation at a county level is 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 massive. So we kind of uh, don't be thinking about any All Ireland at the start of the year because we can't because we, we won't be long getting better if that's our kind of attitude. But um, I know like once you start winning, like you can't beat it, and you want to get that feeling every single year. And uh, we're on a roll now, as I said, but like it won't last forever. So that's why it kind of gives us that extra motivation to stay going while we can. It's part of the motivation the fact that the games come thick and fast and that the split season actually because we, we've heard some people talking about this like the there's it's a really long period of time that you're playing if you're as, as successful at club level as you guys are um, but actually you know I you, you can tell us as a player is that not the best crack it's game not loads of training game not loads of training and actually that's a very nice routine to get into and it turns out all the games tend to be big games yeah, no, this year definitely is a bit season. I'd be 100% in favour of it. Um, it's great to have the final over for Christmas now. Like personally, I wouldn't like to be <laughs> based into the Christmas and then January having to go back hard train and especially in the kind of weather we're in now. So uh, yeah, no, I love it. It's quick, it's fast, it's games. That's all you want. You're kind of just taking over between matches and I'm a huge fan of it anyway, that's for sure. Who was your, who were your Camogie heroes growing up, Neve? Um, well, I suppose from a Galway perspective, uh, Anne Marie Hayes, um, my mother would have been uh, very heavily involved in the Camogie in Galway since we were very small and we'd, she'd be bringing us to every single match. And Anne Marie Hayes, definitely. And also then my auntie, Emma Kilkelly, and my mother's youngest sister. And um, she would have been one person we looked up to. And it was actually extra special with myself and Claude and Orla got to win in All Ireland with her in 2013 with Galway. So, um, yeah, Emma and Amory from a Galway perspective. And then outside of Galway, I was in awe of that Wexford team that one of the three in a row there were my year was going up. And the likes of Kate Kelly, the Lacey's, the uh, Ursa Jacob. And they were an unbelievable team. And they seemed to have like great characters on that team as well. So I used to love watching them growing up. And then obviously when we were playing against Ireland, they were a couple of Ireland, all Irelands, you'd be like nearly like, oh gosh, <laughs> they're here in the flesh. And yeah. <laughs> It must be funny for yourself and your sisters and teammates to now be those heroes that, that you, you've spoken about. Like, there's, um, there's young girls and, and young boys as well, probably at that uh, celebration at one in the morning you were talking about and uh, looking up to you guys now as the as the inspirations. Uh, yeah, I know it's nice. Like, I mean, but, um, I mean, we're only doing what we love, like, and it's easy to do it um, while you have, like, such a strong club around you and all the players and we're all pulling the one way and it's it's just easy when you're winning as well. When it comes to the scoring at the weekend, so was it four points for yourself, two from play, two from freeze? Um, like those those moments, especially where where someone has to step up and look at you as as you said, as you're, you're you're the captain of the team. So stepping up and being the leader in those moments is is something that that comes naturally to you. But it must still feel a little bit extra pressurized when it's an all Ireland final. Ah, yeah, like it probably does. But when you're out in pitch, you don't really feel any of that pressure. I mean, I think it's worse if you're over a team. I think that Dad was saying it's it's worse when you're not playing. You don't have any control over the situation. So we're well used to it. That's probably the one um, positive of being in so many other in the finals. You kind of like just take it. It's match in its own merit. And, and sure, like it's easy to take the freeze. It's a free shot of goal. So uh, no, it's just absolutely delighted. And yeah, it's great. Um, there's a fair bit of travel involved for you. I think if I, if I'm not mistaken, you're working in Dublin, but obviously you've got to get back for training for the club and the the county. Uh yeah. Well, I was my go now this year, um, but uh, I yeah, I go like I'm. I, that's the one positive of COVID, I suppose. I um work in Dublin Monday, Tuesday, then I'd come home Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, and then work from home that day, and then we usually train Wednesday, then back up, and then Friday, and then the weekend as well. So yeah. Kind of on the road constantly, and <laughs> um, but my sister Claude is double basis as well. She's in the exact same position as me, 
So, um, yeah, but it's all worth it now anyway, in the end, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And, like, I'd rather physically be at all the training sessions than missing them because um, it doesn't really replicate you and stuff on your own when you're with the group collectively. So, yeah. I, that's definitely one of the benefits then of COVID, the, the uh, ability to remote work and it just being kind of totally taken for granted that, yeah, we're going to have to do this because that's the way of the world. Yeah, no, like it's 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 the perfect um, mix now because personally, I myself, I wouldn't like working from home five days a week, but uh, it's three and two usually and and that's, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's such flexibility and it's really helped me in my club Komogi career, definitely. So it makes that sustainable then. There's no... Um there's no impetus to slow down. You're, you know, you're talking about harvesting all Ireland and, and trying while you have this golden generation to keep going. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, one hundred percent. Like, um, we're all we're not we're not too old yet anyway, so we'll keep going while we can. And there's plenty more girls coming through to take places. So, uh, there's a serious competition this year. I think this year is the first year where you're like. You know, you wouldn't know what the team would be every single year. And then, obviously, when we lost all the players, we lost from injury then that bore fruit the fact that we had girls that could come in and replace those that were lost straight away. So, uh, yeah, long may continue, but at the same time, we're under no illusions as to it'll end soon or it'll end eventually. Like, you know, you're always going to get fit. You'd get to travel with Cloda then, I guess, for, for matches. At least it makes it a bit easier commuting up and down. I, well, actually, she's a teacher, so she she wouldn't be able to come home. So sometimes right. we do, and sometimes we don't. It's kind of a mixture, but uh, we see we see each other enough. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, like, can you can you empathize empathize with someone like Shane Walsh, who, you know, sees the traveling up and down, and eventually has to go. Well, look, I'm I'm just gonna pick up a club in Dublin and 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 stop that commuting for a while. Uh, yeah, you can see both sides of it. Yeah, and um, definitely. But personally, myself, and um, I don't know, like. There's a special feeling with your own club and I don't think you can ever replicate that with, when you're playing with people you grew up with. Um, it just means, I think, personally, 100% more than that. I mean, I could have easily transferred to a Dublin club, but why would I like to know? There's no better club to play for in Kermogi. So, um, yeah, it just doesn't, I, it wouldn't mean the same to me anyway, personally, but yeah. One life, one club. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, yeah. Well, for me, anyway, until I'm probably not good enough to be playing for it. So, you, so maybe when I get older, you have a bit a special relationship with your with your your granny as well, Neve, for especially the night before matches. Oh yeah, um, yeah. She's brilliant. Uh, she does work beside us. We all just go over to her, and she's um, just she just prays so hard for us. And like, if she wouldn't be uh, watching the matches. She wouldn't even listen to on God if him. She just kind of asks how we got on, and she just say her prayers, light her candles and be asking how everyone is and yeah, I know she's she's my she like but as as every other grandmother and grandfather and we were super supporters and it like it's just the number one topic of conversation of Saracens and seeing them all after the match it kind of makes it extra special. There there is that great scene in in A Year Till Sunday, the, the Galway Night ninety eight documentary where they're bringing the trophy back in and into one of the players' grandparents' houses, I think, and there's the old yeah. grandfather lying in the bed of the trophy. Like, uh, it, it probably brings it home to you how much it means when when you do get to bring the trophy home and and show it to, to people of of various generations, young and old. Oh yeah, no, one hundred percent. And like, you don't realise like how much people like that live for them kind of things. I mean, they get such enjoyment out of us and. It's just delighted to be in a position to be able to give them that joy and uh, they're so proud to be from the area, you know, that kind of way and be telling everyone and it's just, it's brilliant and uh, yeah, as I said, it's uh, just, we're just privileged, like, you know. Well, listen, Neve, congratulations. Uh, enjoy the Tuesday Club and however long it lasts, it's going to be a proper Christmas Club this year, so well done. It's a yeah, sensational definitely. story. Thanks, William. Thanks. It's uh, Neve McGrath there, Camogie legend, um, part of the Sarsfields uh, golden generation who are, as I said, harvesting all Ireland at the moment. A reminder, OTB AM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Quick uh, scan of the newspapers. It's all messy and taken that they're on board last night. They're obviously at home now in real time, but when the papers were going to print, it was uh, messy in his deep vein thrombosis socks. That's <laughs> the back of the mirror. The back of the sun is the same. He's on board. Mm. Uh, it's going to be his cup. Um, I, didn't, I had completely missed the Salt Bay thing. I didn't realise Salt Bay was actually on the pitch harassing Messi looking I mean, for a selfie for anyone who's unfamiliar with Salt Bay, I think a lot of people are familiar with Salt Bay at this stage he's the the celebrity chef who um, famously does the whole salt off his elbow um, and gets plenty of celebrities in I think it's only celebrities and rich people he allows in his restaurant so 
But isn't like the golden stick? Yeah, ridiculous. yeah. I mean, they're bringing it out of a su- out of a suitcase with smoke and all this crack as well. Yeah, so yeah, if you uh, fooling his money, what? Well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Borthwick, I'll bring back joy. New England head coach vows every game matters. Assistant Sinfield to set the tone for the squad's work. I think now, um, Kevin Sinfield, very very impressive character. We had him on. Uh, um, leaders questions with Stuart Lancaster probably three years ago at this stage mm. and I remember off air um, Lancaster was like if I'm ever getting involved in a national team again I would definitely like that guy in my backroom team right. and here he is not that long later like was completely inspirational Was it, did he run a marathon every day for like something ridiculous uh, to raise money for modern neuron disease and he's going to be their defence coach and he's obviously a, a rugby league legend himself so Bordwick has a lot of the elements to make it a success, but um, and as he pointed out yesterday, both like he said, England aren't in the top three of any uh, area of the pitch. Like there's there's no area where you'd say, oh, they're they're actually okay in that department. They're not really at the moment. So it's I was too nice. Claims Jones is the uh, counterpoint that he's the opposite to. Eddie Jones believes he was too nice to his England players before being sacked as head coach. So Borthwick wants to bring back the joy. Eddie Jones says he was too nice. Someone's wrong. We'll see. Mm. We'll see. It's Eddie a, Jones too nice it's a difficult job Borthwick might that? be very good that that would be annoying if Borthwick was really good yeah it's the Calcutta Cup up for them Scotland in the first game of the, the Six Nations I think he's pointing out yesterday it's 40 whatever 40 odd days away so um, he has to turn things around quickly you'd, fe- you'd feel for him because nah. 40 odd days to turn around for Six yeah, Nations you come in it's like they've, they've, they've an endless slew of really good players I don't, I don't feel I don't feel that bad for Steve Borthwick new manager bounce is that what you're saying uh, it's possible Signed a five-year deal. It's going to take them all the way through to the next World Cup as well. Got the so. handy draw in the World Cup as well. So. Handiest of handy draws. Mm. I mean, if they don't reach a final, it's basically a failure. <laughs> no pressure, Steve. Right. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. Yeah. Testing. One, two, one, two. GMAC. One, two. GMAC's morning motivational moment. Or something along those lines. There's so many to choose from. <laughs> Totally forgot about this until just now, Jer, but uh, we're here. We made it. We got the hat on in time. Good morning, folks. Graham at here. GMAC, as uh, you guys like to call me. Some Tuesday morning motivation for you now. Live, laugh, love. Live spelt without the E, if you know what I mean. See you tomorrow. Right. Check out the Lunchtime Wrap today, bringing you all the latest sports news. That's where it's all thanks to Deliveroo. Check out the app for some great match day meal deals across the World Cup. Deliveroo, food, we get it after the break. News Talks crime correspondent Frank Rainey joins us for an update on the ongoing Regency trial. The Club Championship Show on OTB Sports. Brilliant game of hurling, edge your seat stuff, Tony Kelly, masterclass from start to finish. To win a Connacht Senior Championship is uh, it's special. Got even the free drive was waiting for the kitchen sink to arrive. <laughs> kitchen at sink, stage. yes. <laughs> Don't miss a moment of the GA Club Championship. Download the OTB Sports app, subscribe to the GA podcast feed and watch the Club Championship Show every Wednesday across OTB's social channels. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar Right to the latest from the Regency murder trial I'm delighted to say Frank Rainey is with us again Frank good morning to you How are you? I'm good Jared Good morning um, We kind of thought that maybe The courts might close down for Christmas But there's no sign of it just yet no, at this rate, it's looking like I'm going to be having my Christmas dinner with Jonathan Dowdall and co. Um, they're due to wrap tomorrow and they won't sit beyond that. The judges have already said okay. that. But Jonathan Dowdall's cross-examination is ongoing. Um, he's been cross-examined now for five days. He took the stand to give his direct evidence yesterday, last Monday week and he looks nowhere 
done yet. They got as far as the audio recording, this bugged conversation between Jonathan Dowdall and Jerry Hutch as they drove to and from Northern Ireland about one month after the Regency shooting. They spent a couple of hours going through that yesterday, but there still seems to be a long way to go. So if Brendan Grehan, who is representing Jerry Hutch, doesn't finish, finish his cross-examination by close of business tomorrow, then it is likely to um, go back until the new year. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember anybody this high profile being on the stand for so long in connection with any of the trials down through the years. We we generally don't get uh, testimony from the horse's mouth of somebody who has been an associate or involved or in any way um, in the past convicted of any of these crimes. We, nobody tends to testify, right? Yeah, it is unusual. Um, it's it's rare, but it does happen. And I'm reminded of another so-called super grass witness, a man called Martin Byrne, who was um, head of security for the Mansfield family back in the day. And he gave evidence um, at length at the trial of Jim Mansfield Jr., who was subsequently convicted of a very, very serious offence. Now, Martin Byrne claimed that he had been kidnapped and he gave evidence against Jim Mansfield Jr. at trial and was cross-examined at length. But I think from memory, he spent maybe five days right. giving evidence. We've already passed that point now with Jonathan Dowdall. And as I say, it's likely to go on for another couple of days. So and it is quite long. The other thing here is that we also were hearing recordings of Jerry Hutch's voice uh, speaking with Jonathan Dowdall and then asking for, well, what's your interpretation of this thing that you said? Because mm -hmm. he seems to have said some pretty bad things here. Yeah, uh, Mr. Dowdle, is the t general tone of the conversation at the moment. Yeah, and again, we just started really going through the audio recordings with Jonathan Dowdall yesterday. These were played at length um, earlier in the trial. Ten hours of this recorded conversation and every second was played for the three judges presiding over this case. Certain aspects of it were put to Jonathan Dowdall in his direct evidence last week. For example, he was had to put context onto certain parts of the conversation. You know, one that springs to mind is they were talking about three yokes and throwing these three yokes up north and Jonathan Dowdle was asked what does that refer to what are yokes and he said AK-47s he said they were the guns that were used in the Regency Hotel and the prosecution claims that they were going to bring those guns up north um, as a kind of a sweetener in the hope that Jonathan Dowdall's Republican contacts will get involved in an attempt to bring some sort of a ceasefire in relation to the feud with the Hutches. So he was asked about that and a lot of things that have been put to him by the defence under, under cross-examination relate to things that he said, you know, he's heard talking about making bombs, um, he's heard talking about a proposed plan to kidnap the sister of the murder victim, David Byrne, at a dancing competition in M um, he's heard suggesting to Jerry Hutch that he do up a list of people to be executed. And all of these things were put to Jonathan Dowdell under cross-examination by his barrister, Brendan Grehan. And at one point, Jonathan Dowdall said, look, I didn't mean any of those things that I, I was saying. None of those things happened. I don't know how to make bombs. That woman wasn't kidnapped. There was never a list presented to me of people to be executed. He said it was just bravado. He was trying to impress Jerry Hutch. You know, he was talking nonsense. Crap talk is is how he put it. And he did seem to get a little bit frustrated at one point and he um, lost his patience with the line of questioning. And, you know, he said, Mr. Grehan, you're trying to paint me in a certain light. You're putting these things to me that have nothing to do with the Regency attack simply because you want to paint a certain picture. He also accused him of pursuing lines of questioning that were irrelevant. And Ms. Justice Tara Burns interjected at this point and she said that it was up to the court to decide what was relevant and what wasn't relevant. And if she felt that Mr. Grehan was straying down a road that wasn't relevant to his case, then they would intervene. But this was, and he seemed to accept that and they moved on. Yeah, because uh, at one point he, he told <laughs> Brenner Grant to move on. He did, yeah, and there have been some very testy exchanges. Can you just do that? Is that is that how it works in court? Or no, and <laughs> well, well, and and in fairness to Mr. Grehan, he um, perhaps Jonathan Dowdall doesn't know how it works, and which would be unusual because he has been before the courts um, on occasions in the past. But at one point, Brendan Grehan had to point out to him that he was the one that asked the questions and not the other way around. Yeah, so um, like it's it's unbelievably tense. I, I suspect. What's the atmosphere actually like? I think tense is a good way of, of pushing it. And, 
you know, giving evidence, not that I've done it myself, but giving evidence at a criminal trial must be stressful, you know, in general terms. Giving evidence under the set of circumstances that Jonathan Dowdall finds himself must be incredibly stressful. And he has on a number of occasions, particularly yesterday, I think on four occasions, he requested breaks. And he has been offered that opportunity from time to time to take a break. Um, you know, he has now been giving evidence. This is the second week of giving evidence. Today will be day seven. And most of that have been, has been spent under cross-examination. Um, Jerry Hutch, I noticed before Jonathan Dowdall came into court to give his evidence on that first day, seemed very relaxed. You know, he was shooting the breeze with his co-accused. There were two other men on charge all, or on trial, albeit for, for lesser charges. But I think the real drama that's playing out in court is between Mr. Grehan and Jonathan Dowdall as the cross-examination continues. There have been very testy exchanges. Brendan Grehan, when he began his cross-examination on Tuesday afternoon, um, from memory didn't even greet Jonathan Dowdall. He just started out with the statement that um, it was his position that he was a liar, that he had told lies to the court. He said there were two big lies at the heart of his testimony. That of this alleged meeting that uh, Jonathan Dowdall said that he had with Jerry Hutch in a park in Whitehall just a few days after the Regency Hotel shooting. The prosecution is relying on that because Jonathan Dowdall gave evidence last week to say that Jerry Hutch confessed his direct involvement in the murder of David Byrne. He claims that Jerry Hutch told him that he was one of two men who shot him. And he also claims that he met Jerry Hutch the night before that he and his father picked up a key card from the Regency Hotel, that Jerry Hutch was the one that collected it on Richmond Road and that this hotel room we now know was used by one of the gunmen at the Regency, at, at the Regency Hotel. Jerry Hutch has denied all of those allegations. They're very, very serious allegations to make against him. And particularly in relation to that alleged confession, most of the time yesterday morning was spent cross-examining about that. Because what I wondered and what Brendan Grehan asked the witness yesterday was, you know, you have a situation where Jerry Hutch is alleged to have confessed his direct involvement in a very direct way with Jonathan Dowdall just days after the Regency shooting. But then one month later, you know, when a conversation between them is recorded as they drive to and from Northern Ireland, that was a 10 hour drive, 10 hours recorded conversation that was played. And not once does he mention anything about being that directly involved in what happened. And that was pushed to Jonathan Dowdall yesterday. You know, Brendan Grehan wondered the same thing that I wondered, you know, 10 hours of, of a conversation and he doesn't say anything, yet he's spilling his guts to you just a few weeks later in a, earlier in a park in Whitehall in Dublin. And Jonathan Dowdall said, you know, he said, look, he, I didn't ask him. I wasn't going to ask him those questions. He didn't bring it up. He did accept that he never used those words when talking about what happened at the Regency Hotel again after that alleged meeting in the park. And Brendan Grant went further. He also questioned why Jerry Hutch would have requested a meeting in a park in the first place, because he would have, and in fairness, Jonathan Dowdall accepted that Jerry Hutch would call to his house on the Navan Road unannounced. Indeed, he did so two days after this alleged meeting in the park. So Jonathan Dowdall is adamant that this meeting took place. Clearly, Jerry Hutch is denying uh, the murder charge. He denies that meeting. He denies making that confession. So there was an awful lot of to and froing about that yesterday. Okay. And that's kind of in the weeds of where the judges are going to have to decide whether or not they think the testimony of uh, this man is credible enough to secure the conviction. It, essentially, the whole thing comes down to these few days. Certainly a huge plank of the prosecution's case is going to be the testimony of Jonathan Dowdall that confession that I mentioned, this alleged meeting the night before in Richmond Road where he and his father handed over a key card to the hotel room at the Regency, a hotel room that we now know was used by one of the gunmen. So what Brendan Grehan has been doing over the past few days, and again, it will be up to the judges to decide in the facts of the case, to decide in the credibility or reliability or otherwise of Jonathan Dowdall's evidence. But he has been going through his his statements, his interviews with Gardaí after he was arrested in relation to the murder himself back in May of 2016. And he is pointing out lies that he told. Now, Jonathan Dowdall has reluctantly at times accepted that he told lies to Gardaí when he was being interviewed in May 2016. But to justify that, he told Jerry or he told Jerry Hutch's barrister, Brendan Grehan, that he was concerned for his life, he was concerned for the lives and safety of, of his family. He said he couldn't say anything at that time. And he said that he always intended to go to the guards and to tell the truth. 
And when he said that, Brendan Grehan then asked him why it took him six and a half years to do so and why he only did so after the murder charge against him was dropped earlier this year. Um, the other thing that emerged in all this, and I, if, if I've read this correctly, is that um, he has you know, he has a conviction for waterboarding in, in, and that all came about because of something that got found when they were looking for information in connection with the Regency. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Remarkably, um, Jonathan Dowdall um, served a lengthy sentence for torturing a man in his home on the Navan Road. This was back in 2015. He tied a man to a chair in his garage. He put on a balaclava. He claimed that he was the head of the IRA. He waterboarded this man. And this was all video recorded. That recording was put on a USB stick. Jonathan Dowdall lost that USB stick. His home was raided by Gardaí investigating what happened at the Regency Hotel and during the course of that search lo and behold they found the USB stick they must have been just as stunned as Jonathan Dowdall was when they found it and when they discovered what was on it Jonathan Dowdall went on live line after his um, home was searched uh, defending his name he told Joe Duffy that he wasn't involved in criminality all of this was brought up again under cross-examination because what Brendan Grehan was putting to him was that there you are on national radio telling the people of Ireland a lie. Uh, he also claimed that he lied to the Special Criminal Court on a previous occasion and that was in relation to this waterboarding incident because he was asked specifically who took that video and he said that he didn't know and I won't reveal the identity of, of who took that video but it did come up under cross-examination and the point that Brendan Grehan was making was that you did did know and you told the special criminal court back in 2016 that you didn't. And so uh, was it revealed then this time who had taken the video? Is that the... It was in a roundabout way okay. and again I don't think it'd be fair to reveal that person's identity or to say what was what was said in court but the point that Brendan Graham was trying to make or that he did make was that uh, Jonathan Dowdall had lied to albeit a separate or differently constituted but the special same, criminal same court, court but the same principle that he lied in court. Yeah, okay and uh, the uh, obvious implication is how do we know you're telling the truth now? So, right. I mean, it's an incredible story. The whole thing, when you when you consider that, that um, so he'd served that lengthy uh, sentence in between the Regency murder, the investigation into the Regency murder, and this portion here. Yeah. Yes. Right. This this story gets more and more bizarre. The the um, appearance on Liveline, by the way, it's it's available to listen to. It's when you're listening to it, it's like. This is incredible stuff, really. It, it is. And look, it'll be up for the judges to decide what version of Jonathan Dowdall they've been hearing from for the past few days because we've heard from different versions um, of Jonathan Dowdall. The, the man speaking with that bravado and talking nonsense, as he says himself, on that recorded conversation between Jerry Hutch as they travelled up to uh, Northern Ireland. The Jonathan Dowdall speaking to the nation on Joe Duffy that he wasn't involved in criminality. The Jonathan Dowdall who spoke to the Gardaí after his own arrest in May of 2016 and recordings of that interview with Gardaí. This was after he was charged with murder. Again, that murder charge has since been dropped, but he was being arrested and questioned on suspicion of murder and certain portions of that video were played to the court as well and he did again reluctantly accept that at times he was telling lies um, there was a moment on Friday afternoon or just before the court broke up on Friday afternoon where he spoke about and, and, and you felt that he is he is he is tired obviously this is a gruelling process for him but he spoke about I suppose the stress on his life and it reached a point where he said that he didn't care if he was killed he said that um, nobody would touch his family he spoke um, last week about the intimidation or the threat level that has increased since he decided to give evidence against Jerry Hutch. He has made claims of, you know, men with motorbike helmets coming over his wall, letters being put into his post office after he got bail on the murder charge. He has spoken about threats to his family. He says that when he calls his wife from prison, he has met with a barrage of, you know, fresh threats that his family are getting. His 62-year-old mother, he claimed, received a death threat over the phone. She's had to leave the country. His 10-year-old child, his 14-year-old child, he claims they've been getting death threats on Twitter. So he claims that the intimidation against him increased when it was when it emerged that he was going to give evidence. And he said that that's one of the reasons that he didn't tell the truth back in back in May 2016, that he had a real concern for his life and that of his family. Yeah. And so uh, that that is all that's all real. And it's also I mean, I guess the, the other the central plank of the prosecution's um, part here is, is not just that that it's like uh, Jerry Hutch 
did bring him to the north to bring the three yokes up. Like he obviously felt like this was important. He obviously felt like, and it's subsequently even proven they were used in this attack. So, you know, with every bit of um, with every bit of the defence trying to uh, lessen the character or the strength of character of the witness, uh, the prosecution are like, well, you know. Well, again, I suppose that's a case for the judges to decide whether or not the prosecution has proved that point beyond a reasonable doubt. So they will say that Jonathan Dowdall at the behest, again, this is an allegation of Jerry Hutch, that he made contact with his Republican links uh, up north with a view to mediating a peace, um, a ceasefire. Jonathan Dowdall, and again, this is an allegation, would say that at a previous meeting, Jerry Hutch had offered up the guns as a kind of a sweetener to to get a deal done and and also and this is probably crucial as well that you know the defense has gone to great lengths to go through how Jonathan Dowdall's murder charge was dropped you know they were asking him about that under cross examination because their claim that they're making is that this was a quid pro quo that this was a bargain plea that the murder charge was dropped in exchange for him giving this testimony and that the the judges should be mindful of that when they eventually go out to consider the evidence now the prosecution completely deny that, strongly disagree that that was the case. They say that those two things were not linked in any way. They were completely separate. That Jonathan Dowdall has not yet been approved for the Witness Protection Programme, that he is being assessed for it. So, again, it's a case being put forward by the prosecution. The thing is, Jerry Hush didn't have to put forward any sort of defence. He didn't have to cross-examine Jonathan Dowdall. He has chosen to do so. But ultimately, it's up to the prosecution to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, not for Jerry Hush to defend it. Those yokes, or AK-47s you mentioned, Frank, like um, that were supposed to be gifted to the dissident Republicans, Like, is it fair to say Jerry Hutch was quite concerned that they, in any future attacks, if they were used by dissident Republicans, that they might be at some point linked back to, back to him? It was something that was suggested through the audio recording that was played of that bugged conversation as they travelled to Northern Ireland on the 7th of March 2016, which was about one month after the shooting. And they were discussing what to do... Um, with the guns. We heard about Jonathan Dowdall's trip up north before the shooting and this was, according to Jonathan Dowdall's evidence, at the request of Jerry Hutch's brother Patsy, who claimed that his life was under threat. Um, he asked Jonathan Dowdall to intervene. Jonathan Dowdall denied any involvement in criminality, denied being involved with any sort of dissident groups, although he did, again, reluctantly accept that he knew Pierce McCauley. Pierce McCauley, a former provisional IRA man who served a lengthy prison sentence for his involvement in the killing of Detective Guard the Jerry McCabe back in the 1990s. Um, there was a moment under cross-examination where he was asked if he knew any IRA men and he said no, that he didn't. He was asked if he knew any former IRA men and he said that he did and that's where Pierce McCauley entered at the conversation. He was asked if he ever visited him in prison. Jonathan Dowdall said that he had maybe two or three times and there was a very dramatic moment where Brendan Gren pulled the visitor records from Castlery Prison which showed and he went through them in forensic detail which showed that he had actually visited Pierce McCauley in Castlery Prison 14 times on various dates in 2015 and again in early 2016 but again Jonathan Dowdall is at pains he said that he wasn't a close friend of his that yes he knew Pierce McCauley but he's at pains to point out not involved in any criminality not involved with any criminal organisations not involved with the Republican Republican movement or with any dissident uh, groups. As you say on the tapes, when Jonathan Dowdell talks about making bombs and his ability to, to make bombs, very much backtracks in, in court. And yeah, I think he, does, does he talk about the fact that he, he, his skills were from watching movies and television, yeah, essentially? Yeah, that, that, that was his reasoning when he was pushed on it. Now, Jonathan Dowdell's background is in electrics. He was an electrician by trade, and he had, before all of this, he had a very successful electrical company. And there is an allegation that he had agreed to make electrical circuits for bombs uh, for the dissidents. Now, Jonathan Dowdell under cross-examination, because this was something that was discussed on this journey up to Northern Ireland, and Jonathan Dowdall under cross-examination did accept that he told the dissidents that he would try, that he wasn't sure if he could do it, but that he would try. But he claimed in his evidence that he had no intention of doing so. And he was asked about a meeting in County Donegal. This was at the home of the man who was caught with the guns um, in the boot of his car, the AK-47s, as he was travelling northward. He was caught near Slane in County Meath. And Jonathan Dowdall was being asked, he was spotted going into this man's house and he was asked what was in his bag. He was carrying a bag. 
And John of the Dowd all said his tools. And he was asked what those tools were for. And he said they were to fix this man's TV socket. Now, Brendan Grehan didn't quite believe that answer. He did accept it. They did move on. But the suspicion is that he was showing them this electrical circuit, this device that the prosecution or the defence claims that he had made. There was a conversation about a demonstration in those audio tapes. But again, Jonathan Dowdall repeatedly denied that was the case. He said he didn't know how to make bombs. There was a, a, um, a, a detailed conversation in the car about detonators and things like that and blowing up cars, blowing up restaurants. There was a chat about blowing up a caravan with a man in it down in County Wexford. Again, Jonathan Dowdall said this was all bravado. This is all, in his words, telling Jerry Hutch what he wanted to hear. He said he didn't know how to make bombs aside from what he had seen on television and the movies. And that's where he was drawing this knowledge from. He spoke about border control at um, one point, this TV show. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, customs at airports in Australia and all around the world. And he said this was kind of the inspiration for the conversation about bomb making. Okay. It uh, doesn't feel like it's going to finish up anytime soon. No, it doesn't. Yeah. No, no, no. It's it, whether Jonathan Dowdall's evidence finishes up before um, the Christmas break remains to be seen. But what is absolutely certain at this point is that the trial as a whole will not finish before the end of the year. The courts will break for a number of weeks over Christmas. And when they come back, Jonathan Dowdall will either, con- either continue his cross-examination. Remember, the prosecution will be given an opportunity to question him a right of reply if they feel there's anything that he has said under cross-examination that needs to be further clarified. We don't know if any more prosecution witnesses are going to be called. We don't know if the defence is going to call any witnesses. We don't know if Jerry Hutch is going to take the stand. He isn't under any, any obligation to do so. We also have closing speeches to come yet before the judges undoubtedly reserve their judgment and take some time to deliberate. So there's a long way to go yet. I think All that's right. fair to say. Frank, great stuff. Brilliant reporting as ever. Thanks a million. It's uh, Frank Rainey from News Talk there. Now, up next, John Duggan's going to join us in the studio. We'll get his thoughts on the retirement of Davy Russell. First, here's some Fiona Hayes and Rory O'Connor goodness as they joined Joe on Monday Night Rugby last night reacting to Munster's crucial Heineken Cup win. It's back to that old forwards win games adage really if you look at Munster's two opening games. Especially this time of year. You know, it's... um it had a it was a bit old fashioned in a way it had a bit of madness about it it was kind of you know as as uh, Ugo Mola said after the Toulouse Munster game it was more of a European Cup match than a Champions Cup match it wasn't hugely I don't think it was brilliant quality in terms of the, the two teams I think it was it was a bit mid-table well, I was going to um, say if you were a neutral watching that you'd say oh well this is a mid-tier European mm-hmm. yeah and I enjoyed it and, 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 and an enjoyable one at that it was it was two teams going for it mm-hmm. in, the, in a difficult conditions Neither of whom I think are going to be there at the elite edge of the tournament. Or, you know, I think Northampton are a decent Premiership team who can't extend themselves over two tournaments. They went hard in terms of their team selection, um, but their lack of their, their inability to break Munster down in the second half, like they could still be there now and they'd yeah. be they'd be struggling. Now the ref gave them a few helping hands along the way, but you know Munster would feel they got the they didn't get the rub of the green against Toulouse a week before, so that you know they were owed it. So there's. Um, it it was it, it was thoroughly enjoyable and no more so when they were having a big scrap in the middle of the pitch like that was that was great like you know you talk about it when it didn't you know Friday was so anemic and behind the closed doors was so anemic on Saturday this was this meant something to the people who were there there was yeah. a reasonable travelling crowd over it looked like there was a bit of there was a bit of life to this game and with that and there's a lot to be said for that even if the quality wasn't brilliant so um, it was a good win a very good win and it's again co- coming from where they're coming from having dipped badly at the start of the season there is a steady sign. That obviously the team are playing for the coaches that there's a bit of spirit there that there's a plan there that they're following they're not able to solve everything themselves and they were making like I think Dave Kilcoyne gave away the same penalty three times in a row and was lucky not to go into the sim bin during that second half so they still need to learn on the job and they can't be satisfied with it they gotta go that's a good win let's get better and not go that's a good win. We're all legends. Let's 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 just take the Chris, like take Christmas off, which has happened the odd time under Munster over the last couple of years where they've had a great Heineken Cup win. This isn't a great one, but it's a good one. And then they haven't backed it up and no better way to back it up than when Leinster come to town on Stevens' day. It's uh, Roy O'Connor and Fiona Hayes talking with Joe Malloy last night on Monday Night Rugby. And a reminder, the only place to listen back in full to Monday Night Rugby and Wednesday Night Rugby and Brian O'Driscoll is on the OTB Rugby podcast feed. So just subscribe there on the OTB app or wherever you get your podcasts and more Heineken Champions Cup coverage coming on the show tonight and tomorrow as well. Now, John Duggan is here with us this morning at 8.44. John, how are you? Ger and Shane, how is the form? Happy Christmas to you. And yourselves. Happy this Christmas. is my last uh, supper, so... Oh, lovely. Um, great working with you guys, and uh, if I enjoy the chats. There you go. Well last done. Last of the year. And 
if you want to listen back, folks, to the books and documentaries thing we did on Saturday, Malachi Clark and Ross Whitaker, they're on the, the podcast feed as well. Very good. For all your recommendations, either in an aural or in terms of what's in front of you on the page. Did you have any um, recommendations? I haven't actually read that much. Um, I read the Phil book, uh, but I'm, I was more in a voyage of discovery, to be honest. I saw the Ronaldo documentary recently that was very good, the original Ronaldo. Um, but I've, uh, I, I just need to get into the... I bought the Charlton Brothers book last week. Right. And I bought the Ian and Ulrich book, but I haven't got into anything really specific. Some, more, some Usually around this time of the year, I would have been much more advanced than that, but whatever reason. What's or, your primary function? Of, is it reading? Is it watching? Is uh, it socialising? Uh, it's, it's, it's meeting friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Um, like we talk about Lionel Messi being a hero, and Lionel Messi's given a lot of joy to everybody in, in world sport, but he's not a hero of mine. He's somebody that you, you, you really admire what he does, but he's not a hero. Mm. Um, your friends and your family are heroes so the people I haven't seen for a long time meeting up with people I haven't seen they're coming back or whatever and meeting with family that, that's what the ritual is and they'll probably get one day out of Leper's Town as well that's what it's about it's just a bit of a bit of or and or and a bit of just a bit of culture if you can and, and just you know enjoying the company of others because like last year we had restrictions yeah you know you yeah. kind of forget that don't you you do forget that Find a stout on the Bailey's Coffee are you a Bailey's Coffee man I mean everything apart from three things white wine tequila and coffee Everything else is on the agenda. Right. White wine, tequila and coffee. Yeah. You wouldn't go for a tequila with a bit of... I had a bad experience in tequila. I had to be dragged across a dance floor by my hair when my early 20s for um, going a bit too mad on tequila at one of these college balls because I got got hold of the college card. So it leaves some bad memories in you. It did, yeah, because I woke up in in a flat that wasn't mine. And somebody came into the flat and said, what the hell are you? Who the hell are you? <laughs> so it was my last memory of tequila. Now, that was like when I was young and irresponsible, like, so well, or whatever, 20 years ago. But uh, I actually couldn't actually physically drink it after then. Never liked the taste of coffee and white wine. Don't like the taste. You might, I'm sure you guys have your own I know tequila, drinks tequila's, you can't drink either. Tequila's tough to drink. Well, good, good tequila, it turns out. We, we've never had good tequila. Well, well, you know, those slammers was not good. And it's not supposed to be slammed. It's supposed to be sipped, right. it turns out. And right. it's quite nice now. I mean, now, now you're, you're a little bit mature. Yeah, well, yeah. it's interesting because I, I never would have been able to drink whiskey or understand it, whereas I've had good whiskey this year and good bourbon, and you've had a completely different experience. When I think a, a tequila is fairly similar. Similar, yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't give up on it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Get out that salt shaker. No, no, no salt, <laughs> no salt. Um, we should talk about Davy Russell, yeah. right? Because we didn't do it properly yesterday in the show. Okay. Um, in the summer, the hottest day of the year in the summer, I got you to met go down. Virginia, yeah. yeah, and um, and just like his farm is in a beautiful part of the world, and um, we spent I don't know the afternoon filming and just chatting and meeting the family and the piece of work that we produce is really beautiful. You should, you should we we we'll, we'll repost it, but it was clear. It was clear at that stage that he was finishing up. Yeah, you know, his, his body had kind of was beginning to break down, and the recovery from injury was more difficult now than it had been in the past. And it, you know, when he was talking about the future, it was like there's a, a future for him that isn't um, just identifying as the jockey, but like he was, he was just in love with the land and farming and the animals and the lifestyle. And it was it was um, uh, Tom Wolf wrote. Uh, many great books, but there's there's one about um, uh, uh, car drivers who are moonshiners and people who are mad into just being artists. And it struck me that this was somebody who was born to be what he had become. He's of the land. He's of the horse. Yeah, and like the the incredible peaks that he hit at various stages in his career were fully deserved. Like. He was as good as any of his peers, um, and his peers were the greatest of all time. Yes, and that's incredible. It like is. They, they all yeah. kind of dragged each other up. They did. I think oh, uh, it is a golden generation that's gone. I think one of the big parts of that, Jerry, is that they were all great communicators in their own way. Ruby, Barry Garrity, um, Paul Carby communicated on the horse. Tony McCoy. These are big characters. These are big, big personalities, and we haven't really like we, we're waiting. It'll take a few years for the next group of of people to articulate themselves. But, you know, racing, all sports are popular. Snooker, you know yourself with Ronnie and Stephen Hendry mm-hmm. and Ken. You have to have the personalities. Formula One in the 80s was so popular because of Senna and Prost and different types of personalities. And that's what racing and Davey Russell, I felt, was always a very good communicator, good crack, hardy guy, 
would talk about himself as a, you know, being sometimes cross, but I never found that. I always found him quite a gentleman to deal with and just a hardy jockey. Like a, all the all the injuries he went through, 1,579 winners over 23 years. Like 25 Cheltenham Festival winners, Grand National twice, uh, the Gold Cup. Like the, the, the ride he gave Lord Windermere to win the Gold Cup in 2014, he was almost about to pull the horse up halfway around and he just kept on pushing away and pushing away, pushing away. Horse that eventually responded, he won on the line. There's a horse called Mansoni he rode in 2007 at Punchestown. Once again, they all cut each other's throats at the back. And that is a, that is a skill, that is an art, that is what you're talking about. The, the um, in simpatico with the horse to be able to know the time and the rhythm of a race. And Davey was always good at the maturity of being able to generally have his horse in the right spot in races. So um, it is some career. And as I said, again, I think his personality was a big part of that. I think he's um, he's involved in with younger horses now. Is it pin hooking or whatever they whatever they call it? And uh, yeah, look, he's, he's from from the from he's from the county where the first people chase paws. It's funny when Joe mentions Tom Wolf, like the right stuff is another one, and, and it's hard to know what the, the that right stuff is that makes up a jockey. But you you, you certainly have to have whatever that is. And Davy Russell had it, whatever it is in spades. Like he was just someone, someone. He was a jockey's jockey. Yeah, he was a horseman, and there's an obsession to that, and it's rare that you can decide yourself when you've got to go out of it. Yeah. Ruby did it, and Davy's now done it. A lot of other jockeys have been just told you, you've got to go retire because of injury, you know? Is he the last of that great era? I would say so, yeah. 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 Now it's about Jack Kennedy, now it's about Sean O'Keefe, now it's about these other young jockeys coming up. Darrow O'Keefe, Paul Tennant, obviously, is the main man at the moment. So, look, we're lucky to have them, and we would have known from... The, the racing coverage that we did, you know. Yeah, I, I hope he gets involved in media and yeah. stays around TV and that we hear more from him um, because there's... Uh, Some funny stuff going around on social media about the, the Cheltenham Press Nights and um, just funny stuff. He's just, he, he just, he's just witty and racing needs to be accessible in that regard because sometimes it can be a little bit insular. Yeah. All right. Well, we wish him the very best and um, I'm delighted for him that he, he's got out on his own terms. Yeah. Um, and like obviously he'd been dying for this to happen because you know normally you'd wait for something like the Christmas festival is just here yeah. so obviously he'd had enough and it was like okay winner let's, winner let's winner chicken winner. dinner yeah, yeah. let's go and you decide as well and, and for people not to know is cool as well yeah. you can decide and that's, that, that's, that's good you know okay so we did ask you for some um, yeah cup, our, our crazy awards uh, niche moment Messi and Vad Veghorst can you hear Bobo that was my niche moment um, the choke was Spain passing the ball around a thousand times around the roundabout and then losing to Morocco penalties after beating Costa Rica 7 in the opening there game. There is an argument Spain with a choke because I, I had Denmark in my in my head as honourable mentions given everyone had them as dark horses myself included but Spain is a good choke because after the first game you're thinking yeah. we're looking at the world champions. Contenders, yeah. yeah. So yeah the um, fact that they went on to do nothing essentially of note is surprising. And, and they're Players choked in the in the shootout as well. I felt they were like they looked like about ten years of age. Yeah. Um. But they're massive contenders for USA. You'd have to think because Argentina won't be. I don't think. I think that's the end of the line for for Messi and Argentina. Our personality is Andres Cantor, the man who called that winning penalty for Argentina. Uh. Who um. Is it Mont- Montiel's winning penalty? It was. Uh, it's hard not to get emotional watching that. Ah, it is. Yeah. Um. It shows what it means. Um. Campeón del Mundo! You know, it was, it was amazing. 36 years. Like, Messi wasn't born the last time Argentina won the World Cup. Uh, the worst sports washing uh, is... <laughs> the bisht. <laughs> you were getting a bit of trouble for this yeah. on social media. Yeah. Yeah. What happened? Is that, I mean, t- start at the start. Don't leave anything out. What happened? I just saw this happening and I just thought... I was so excited about Messi winning this World Cup. And the reason why I'm excited about it is that I think Messi, the the BBC did an interview um, where they showed Messi when he was a young kid being interviewed. I said, what's your dream? My dream is to play for Argentina. And I think that the, the, whatever about Messi, like Messi's employed by the Qataris and he's a Saudi Arabian tourism ambassador. So he's happy to, you know, be commercially associated with certain um, countries. Um, but that's not really relevant. Like Messi's brought so much joy over so many years. And I thought his chance had gone. And... Uh, for me, the, the the beauty of Messi is that he gives uh, inspiration to any young boy or girl in the world who admires what he does and loves his beauty of the way he plays the game, that they can dream that they can do something. Because he had a dream and he achieved it. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the moment I'm so excited now. We're all so excited to see Messi lift that trophy. And then the Amir Qatar, as culturally um, 
honourable and as significant as it might be, decides, okay, well, here, we're going to present you with this before the World Cup you know, trophies presented to you. I didn't think it was appropriate whatsoever. Not culturally, but for the timing of it, I thought the time of it was so inappropriate. I got really angry about it when I saw it, and I just said it on Twitter, and then there was a good reaction in terms of people um, maybe felt that that resonated with them, and then I got a lot of backlash for it. Um, and Because maybe people in the Arab world felt that uh, there was a some kind of um, offence, uh, you know, uh, construed where there wasn't. Where was the backlash coming from? Uh, you know, the Arab world. Uh, so, and, you know, you're labelled as this, you're labelled as that. And other people have got it. I've seen it from other, you know, people in this business. Yeah. I've seen it from Miguel. I've seen, like, Joe getting a bit of stick. And just for pointing out, like, you know, it's not about the culture. We all respect people's culture and race and all that mm. kind of thing. My sister lived in Kuwait for 30 years. You know, my brother-in-law was from has an Arabian background, Kuwaiti. But it's about the timing of it. Like, I didn't feel like you're covering the Argentinian shirt uh, when the World Cup's about to be lifted. And and also, this will be used for 40 to 50 years. That like There probably won't be the image. There'll be other images used. But generally, the image of a World Cup is when the trophy's lifted back to Franz Beckenbauer or any other... Um, like Bobby Moore, you know. Uh, so that for me was just the complete denouement of sports washing. They almost could have had it where he puts on the bisht, gets the, to to receive the trophy from the Emir of Qatar, get a couple of photographs, take it back off again, and then go over to his teammates. Like I thought, maybe that that moment with his teammates, they all should have been in the Argentine jersey. Messi stands out because he's in something no, different. He didn't. He didn't look unhappy to to wear it. No, of course. I, I don't. I don't know if you guys felt as angry as I did about it. It yeah. felt strange watching it at the time. Yeah, like um, it. Here's the thing, right? If uh, if the World Cup was in America and the final was in Honolulu and they put a, a flower garland around him, you might have thought, okay, okay. But here's the thing. The, the bisht isn't just a thing that is imbued with uh, cultural meaning in the place that uh, it would traditionally be worn. This is now has a cultural meaning around the world because of the sports washing, because of everything else that's gone on before, because of the refusal to allow the uh, the armbands or the last minute, no, you can't have Budweiser, because of everything else that has happened, because of the many thousands of dead people who died, who were sacrificed so that that country could have that World Cup and have that moment. That's why you don't get a free pass when you're like, oh, it's just a cultural thing. No, it's not. It stands for... It, it's, a, it's a clear example of everything that you've been trying to uh, achieve and it's so naked and it's so it's so needy and uh, it when people show you who they are believe them and um, good piece by Miguel Delaney today about it yeah it's, it's a, it is really it's it's they got what they wanted they got what they paid for guitar yeah. they got what they paid for yeah. now I, I, I won't remember the bish. I'm going to remember Messi, and I'm going to remember the fact that they took it off pretty quickly, and they got a new jersey yeah. with the three stars on yeah, it pretty it's, quickly. Yeah, and absolutely. At the, but at the time, I was, you know, there's so much. Oh, you're like, right. I think. You know, at, at the time, we're, here we go. This is going to be it. This is the moment, and we're all going to go. Yes, in our living rooms around the world, and then it's what the hell's going on here? Well, yeah. people were pointing out the Pele and Mexican hat in 1970, but that, that, that was after the trophy. Like, that that was in the crowd, you know, whatever. Um, this was a, 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 like, and apparently, as Dion Fanning was saying last night, they were going to put on Larice. Yeah. So <laughs> weren't going to put it on loose. No, no. So, uh, so this was for Messi, and it just like completely looked alien within the picture of the Argentinian uh, players that 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 would be happening. Um, so yeah, no, I, I just at the time, and then so had he, Messi agreed in advance to it. Like, he, must have, he, he didn't look surprised. He didn't look surprised at all. No, he didn't, he didn't. Uh, look, and maybe he's comfortable. And maybe he will you know, say in in due course that look, I was happy to do. Whatever. Well, I mean, we, uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard to go. Yeah. Um, Anyway, all yeah. right. Uh, the, the the last one was fan interaction, which was, I don't know if you guys said this, Je suis un baguette. No, it didn't oh, make we, our we list. Left that out. From yeah. Eddie O'Keefe in Limerick. Yeah, that was a great moment. The Irish making their stamp once again. Well, you yeah. know. There was it, a Dublin fan in the crowd amongst the RGs. It was. Well. It's such a cool jersey. Our man guys as well, I saw as well. They yeah. did well. Yeah. The Dubs yeah. did well. Yeah. Right. Anywhere. Sickening, isn't it? OTB AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Good stuff, John. Happy right, Christmas to you. And yourselves. Have a great time. Thank you, John. Thank and you. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you today. OTB Gold at one o'clock is Keith Andrews meeting Philly McMahon. Three o'clock is a classic dad cast. Our career retrospective is Barry Garrity at four. Cora Staunton is OTB Gold at six. And the show is live tonight with Joe Malloy with the return of a slight tangent and plenty more besides. You can follow off the ball across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in the latest sports content.
Up next, former Dock Manager Vinnie Perth joins us in the studio to give us his team of the World Cup. First, from last night's news round, Joe, Mick and Richie had a debate about where this World Cup ranks all time. For extra time with the stakes so high to turn into wildness, yeah, like absolute wildness was the most unexpected aspect. Even Messi's goal, I was watching in here in studio we, with, alongside Keith Tracy and in the build of Messi's goal, we're sort of watching and we're saying, why France have nobody back? Why is this so open? Yeah, What's going on here? Hey, yeah. the, 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 one of them didn't put the shutters down and say, keep it tight. They both said, let's all turn off our minds and just play on instinct. And then penalties was its own kind of wonderful drama. But I can't remember extra time being so crazy when the stakes were so high. So just all kinds of insanity, Richie McCormick, all kinds of insanity. Yeah, I've had a bit of distance from it now, obviously. We're about 24 hours removed from, from the end. Uh, and I, at the time, I think was saying, like, probably the best World Cup final of my lifetime. And then I was kind of zoning out and going, well, for 80 minutes, it wasn't. Like, and it, that it very definitively wasn't the best final of all time. Yeah. So you're kind of thinking, like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't have an answer for this. It's like, whether or not that final 10 minutes or whatever it was, plus extra time and penalties, um, makes up for what went in the 80 minutes preceding it. And whether Although it it's becomes, a low bar, isn't it? They're, they're uh, all rubbish. The finals are all rubbish. CB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Who is this serving and what is the end goal would be coming nice to know. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. I feel like we haven't had quite enough Irish bias this year, so I am quite happy to see this. Yeah. They were awesome. It's true what Emma Carroll said. Liverpool are coming into their own, right? Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, it's a minute past nine. Vinnie Perth is with us. Vinnie, good morning to you. Morning, how are we doing? Uh, we had Jean-Philippe Leclerc of L'Equipe on yesterday and um, certainly all the analysis in uh, this part of the world and on the TV channels that I was watching in the first half was like, oh, the virus must have really ripped through France because they're so terrible. He's like, I uh, didn't think so. He just thought that they got, they got, they got done. Yeah. So for me, the World Cup final was, I think, first of all, your first reaction was, what a brilliant final, okay? Amazing game of football, had a bit of everything. Um, I, I know there's this co common thread that it, it took 60, 70, 80 minutes to get going. But it was also underneath it all, uh, a brilliant tactical final from two brilliant coaches. Um, it was fascinating. It was an absolutely outstanding game, but also tactically it was outstanding. And it also showed the difference mindset of people. And uh, we like to bash England here, so very quickly say the difference between Argentina was they exploited the space behind Mbappe, where England defended the space in front of him. Front of him. And there you go. That's it. It's about winning a World Cup or not win. Now, the flip side of that is Mbappe still scored three goals. Yeah. One penalty, don't get me wrong. But it's about season the moment and that's where uh, the highest level you've got to go and win, win games of football. So, um, to, to, like, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy before the games to work out what teams are going to do to a point. So, uh, the natural reaction was Angel Di Maria started the game, came in and was brilliant in the game. Was that what won them the game? Did he catch the French out? And was it the virus? And it was actually, it was neither the two of them, although I'm sure they had different uh, parts in it. Like, I checked on uh, Griezmann, who was very quiet in the game, on his stats, 
they were the same as they have been in terms of his running were and they? different things. There's nothing nothing that you would say if you were a coach of France looking at a stats saying, Oh, what happened here? He's twenty five percent off already. Yeah, no, no. Nothing nothing that would s- suggest that. So I don't think it was the Forest. Like we all we, I, I think it's fair to say and again I look at I, I'm able to enjoy football, jump off the sofa when, when that Mbappe uh, equalizer went in. What an amazing pe- piece of stuff. But then Sadly, I sort of analysed the game over the next 24 hours. Right, where was a one? And so, you, don't get me wrong, I lived in the moment and enjoyed it. But France played are typical. When they have the ball, it's three. Hernandez is really high up, which is now Mbappe come into the sort of pocket. They, that's how they play with the, the pivot of uh, Chiuami and Ravelo in midfield. That's fine. That's, that's how they play when they have the ball. Argentina, where they made that slight change was they brought uh, Angel Di Maria into the left wing position and without the ball they did a 4-4-2 and the Paul sort of played on the right hand side of a midfield tree and broke out into that area and that's that's how they played so the 4 becomes a 3 or 3 becomes a 4 yeah, so together. effectively uh, it's a it's a it's a, a sort of a uh, uh, four four two from Argentina with Messi and Alvarez wor- working in different positions, and that's fine. But the 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 key to it all was um, when Argentina had the ball, they went into um, uh, and and something that will. There's a lot of talk about what did we learn in this World Cup? Has it changed in terms of shapes and systems and different bits and pieces? But um, Fernandez's position in the pivot or the number six position, nobody has really made a good job of that in the World Cup. Nobody at all, right? But in the World Cup final, Fernandez dropped into between the back four or different stages. Argentina had a back three when they had the ball, okay? But the key to their success was... Um, De Paul then went into that area behind Mbappe, and he he ran the show from there. Okay, and not that not that in terms of being on the ball, he was brilliant or different bits and pieces. It dragged out Rav- Ravelo of a position like where do I go, and all of these things. What 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 these built up to was people saying France look a half a yard off, where they weren't. They were actually tactically beaten right. so as a footballer uh, in the middle of a game or a coach you're like how are these getting so much time and space in the ball almost because France have a virus yeah. that was the com- and I understood why a commentator would do that but it was actually so much more more than that and actually the first 40 minutes 45 minutes of the game Messi was brilliant again in that same position where he came uh, in behind where Mbappe had left and Argentina's right back was that high up the pitch that Hernandez had to mark him and then on the other side with the Di Maria effect meant France had a, just a flat back four yeah. and the were complete pitch was too big for them and if you if uh, if you go into it and look at moments where Messi picks the ball up in the half position in that sort of right midfield role or or the Paul as I said they couldn't live with it and that's where it was just brilliant by Argentina. It got them into the lead. It got them the foothold in the game, and it was sensational. Would Angelo Kante have fixed some of that by like? Not necessarily, because the running power that was needed, it was it was a change of shape. France shape was wrong. Uh, but Rabiot might not have been smart enough to understand this is happening to me, and I need to impact. Or Shimini is very inexperienced at that level. He's a very very good player. Don't but get the, me wrong, the problem but was if you, it, it, the problem is with that is. And this is where you often see players start to fight with each other in the middle yeah, of games, yeah. whether it's in the Phoenix yeah. Park, whether it's in a World Cup final. Once Ravelo shifts out, which he had done all tournament to a point, to a point, but nobody exploited it that well. England tried to do it with Henderson at times, didn't have the same quality, obviously. Okay, well, what can you do then? Well, to, to be fair to France, and this is where it was a brilliant tactical World Cup, and to be fair to Deschamps, right? What he done was brilliant. He's, he took off two players. And people say France didn't get going till 80 minutes. Yeah, I get that. But he took off two players in the first half and flipped that straight away. Straight away, he changed his whole team to a uh, basically a 4-2-3-1. And why did Griezmann not have a great game? Because he played a large part of his number 10. And sort of it was a change of position for him. He brought on pace in the wide areas in uh, Turam and... Oh, man. Yeah, on the other side. And that then shored up. That allowed then to have the double pivot, as you're saying, with Ravelo and too, too many, which meant the half position for DePaul was gone. Right. And the game changed on that. And uh, the whole sort of World Cup in, in, or the whole World Cup final then switched. And I know it took France a long time to get back into it. 
But but they weren't out of it the way they had. They been. went out of it, and and it was like they had found their feet. Argentina yeah. were still. They started the second half. Argentina obviously whatever happened in that dressing room, they were roiled up, and that was grand. France seen that sort of first four or five minutes. And then just slowly in- inched away into the game. People talk about control, controlling games, and you can control games now in different ways, with or without the ball. Yeah. But all of a sudden, the threat of Messi in that second half got less and less and less. And then Argentina reacted, made certain substitutions, and tactically, Deschamps won the battle to a to a point. Were France ill prepared for Angel Di Maria being on the pitch? No, but that, that's the point. It was. It wasn't just that. It, in in many ways, that was. They the centre half up against Di Maria. It was that could have been an easily match up, but it was the tactical on the other side yeah, yeah. that actually meant France were were forced back. And the players, like um, Griezmann, done, was brilliant in the tournament of turning up in different areas when they needed to go and press with the with the front three done it. But the problem was um, Argentina's midfield was so spread out where. Uh, the Paul turn in that area like Alexis uh, McAllister was brilliant in the game in his running power if you see the second goal that's not down to necessarily the shape but that running power when you've got a midfield of a 1-1-1 one, one, and one, as in 1-6-1-8-10 one, one, to use the football numbers then it's it's how do you how do you mark them as a tree so to be fair to Deschamps, he got it and said, we've got to go in and, and go in after Fernandez, who's controlling the game, and we've got to give Ravelo a bit more uh, space to be able to come out into the deep hall or Messi's position. Um, is it, just to quibble with the Deschamps won the tactical battle, is it not that they actually ended up in a stalemate because he lost the start? Well, well like, football's all about moments, sorry. Yeah. Like, okay, he, he loses the start, of course you do, because he's, what, what, if he did change, why change? But you do, I think you do have to change. So This is probably, a very interesting philosophical pit, pit here, right? Because yeah. um, I think Joe mentioned this last night um, on the news round about Guardiola getting grief for constantly changing. Maybe it was Mick, I'm not sure. One of the, one of the lads mentioned it anyway. And... Um, I, I definitely I would frequently have thought like look at the quality of my team I'm Pep Guardiola we're brilliant just go for it but, yeah, but now you, I'm coming around to you have to remember the opposition now like Fran- I, I could tell you how France is going to p- play within an inch of their life okay um, I could tell you before the cup final exactly how they were going to play it wasn't going to change so, but at the same time Argentina knew that all their analysts knew that people knew that they knew where the space was I was in here speaking to you about um Poland and France and remember Matty Cash for yeah. the, Matty Cash had so much space he whipping balls into the box it was cleared by the Griezmann all of a sudden uh, Mbappe scored 10 seconds later big moment for him in that, in that game and I'm saying to you a better player would exploit um, that I thought England that, and that's the, to go back not to go back to England but tactically Southgate okay, just got it wrong it, like he got it wrong I understand starting Henderson but the space was in that area behind Mbappe that actually the first team that really exploited them was Argentina Yeah. where I say Deschamps won the tactical battle is he ultimately lost the game okay and this is football this is fine margins if I'm telling you now if France had scored that late goal yeah yeah his he would have been a tactical genius when all was said and done by the time we stripped the game back yeah, yeah. and said the pace he brought on the two changes switching to a 4-2-3-1 was something a world class management decision that won him the World Cup and hey but, that's football but as much as he deserves praise for those decisions Vinny like, is, there an, is there the argument that he made those decisions slightly too late even though it was still you know what 40 minutes played where he brings the two lads on oh yeah like if I you do it 10-15 I mean, minutes I mean, earlier I, I, remember do, I remember doing a one, losing 1-0 to UCD and it doesn't equate to France and Argentina World Cup final I'll tell you what when you do it like it is it's a big 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 call and you know, you've worked. They've worked all the time on on what, how they play. They've a set way of playing. They know what what is needed. Every everyone knows that Griezmann knows his job. All all of these things. They were just out thought of on the day mm. for such a long period that they had to react. And it was like, it's hindsight. Hindsight is amazing. But but it was so close to being. I do amazing performance by Deschamps. I don't. I don't think you can say it's too late, though, right? Because. There's a one-on-one chance with 123 minutes on the clock yeah. where you have like the ball bouncing in the air to a striker who's in form 
against a goalkeeper who's very tired and all he's got to do is stick it in the net and you win so but, like, it's, it's not too late but it takes the 70, 70 minutes for France to get into the game it does it maybe it, they, it takes an hour, hour maybe but, 60 but, minutes to get into the game but, then. but it actually didn't Shane it took 40 minutes and then all of a sudden the tread of Argentina was a little bit less okay France weren't cranking loads and they've changed their shape of how they played for the whole tournament I still felt the first in the five, middle of the game the first five minutes after the second half or into the second half I still felt Argentina looked yeah, yeah. The more dangerous. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm sitting there for 70 minutes thinking this is going to be a bit of a dab squib of a World Cup yeah, final. Yeah, don't yeah. Get, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm with you. Argentina that. and they're But at the same up. time, as a coach, you can only slowly, they, they slowly turn this around. And I keep, I, I just struggle to pr- pronounce the French striker's name. But if that goes in, yeah, and that's why actually yeah. the biggest moment of the World Cup was Martinez save in that moment. And there's an amazing photograph. You should. Like have a look at from behind the goal. It is just an amazing save, and yeah. it's won them the World Cup. And it's meant that the champ is maybe under pressure with certain people in France. I don't know in terms of th- he should have won. It was just brilliant. It was tactically yeah, brilliant, I, I and think, yeah. it's right on the edge. And hey, that's that's the ho- football at the highest level. A uh, question from Colum wondering: Do you risk losing the player forever if you whip them off after forty minutes? Yes, absolutely. And so that's you, the now. Remember. You're taking off Giroud, who may or may not come back. And yeah. different, but in that moment, in a World Cup final, you're not thinking of... It, you, that is the biggest concern of any manager or coach standing on the sideline. Taking a guy after 20 minutes, hey, he's, he's a long way back for you. long way back. Yeah. But sometimes it's not down to that player's performance. Sometimes it's it's a, it's very much tactical because... You're, you're look, actually Dem- making a mistake as a coach, by the way, as well. Well, that's, that's why I was saying... And, and how you sell that in the dressing room is... I made a mistake here. That's yeah. an ego. That's an I, ego I brought hit for Jamie you. McGrath on after 20 minutes. Dundalk was struggling. I was only in the job a few weeks, and I just turned and said to assistant manager, I've "Got to make this. Ch- are you sure?" And basically, the same what I would have said. Assistant R- Rory Higgins said to me, "We made the change. Beat UCD two uh, one. It was a huge moment for me, but I lost the player. I lost the player that I, that I take off, and it was a long way back for for the two of us, like because I'd made it. I'd made a mistake, mm. and it, it's it's." I tell you, it's such a difficult thing what he done in that first half. But did you address it straight away, or did you wait weeks? Or how did you fix it? The, the player wasn't there after the game, right? Because is, is there? And I didn't blame him for that, to be honest. I didn't go in and go, "Oh, you're like the laziest thing is the coach to go in and go, oh, you're fine. You left it. You left it." I went, "No, if I was a player, I'd be really hurt." But uh, I went and met him, had a cup of tea with him, you know. But deep down in his own mind, he's like. You're taking the piss out of me. And that's the way they see it. And you have to understand that. And you have to live in their world. So an alternate universe in where, you know, Dembele had to come off because he was useless. But uh, Giroud just hadn't got into the game yet. Is there an argument that last uh, chance for Colin Mouani, like if that falls to a player like Giroud? Yeah, it, it, there is. And and to be fair, um, but remember, the penalty was won by pace. Sheer pace put on Mendy in so much pressure. It was a flick on by Mbappe and pure pace. Won, wins them the free kick or wins them the penalty that gets them into the game so look uh, there's an argument Giroud one sub might have been enough in terms of uh, Mbappe's pace and Turam's pace but he, he made a wholesale change and in almost was the most perfect manager like we talk about managers making big decisions on sidelines that was huge, huge. it's funny you talk about the, the small margins because we're saying that Southgate got it wrong and yet if Ken scores that penalty and England have the momentum into the, going into extra time all of a sudden he's the genius yeah look that but Shane that's a bigger argument the point I make about Southgate getting it wrong is he he, he tried not to lose to France instead, of, tried to, instead win, yeah. of tried to win now the flip side of what I'm saying is Mbappe still scores three but you have to like I always make the point and it's someone who's who's lost his, his job in football go you, re- you when you sit there, no matter what level you work at, it's you. You remember the ones you should have done. Mm. It's so easy. Like it. It's a bit like people now talking about this World Cup, saying the World Cup was brilliant, and it was. But the easiest thing to do in football is to be a defensive coach. It's easy. If a, any manager takes over a club, generally they say, "Oh, you stop. Got to stop conceding goals." No, she's Sherlock, like, yeah. and because he knows he goes in training ground and does a defensive session. The hardest part of football is creating an environment for attacking players. It's the imagination. It's all of these different things, and it's played out like that in the World Cup as well. It's it's a lot easier to be Morocco than it is to be Brazil in terms of creating chances, scoring goals, and and it's it's so that's where. Surely Southgate was sitting there going, I should actually, okay, the game changed. After 70 minutes, he might have been on a sofa going, 
you know, I should have done what Argentina did and just forgetting the Mbappe part of it to a point and just went for it. And just you, went for it. You, you talked about the tactical nuances that we've seen in, in, across the World Cup and, you know, all those FIFA reports and stuff of, of little nuggets and arson fingers yeah. come out saying different things, you know, whether it's goalkeepers being on the ball more or wide players getting on the ball more. Like, uh, what, are the, what are the big takeaways from, from this World Cup tactically? Will we look back on this as a, a turning point in any way in terms of style of football? I, I, I'm conflicted on that because... Like, I'm listening to people say, and people I really listen to and respect and say, oh, the ticky-tacky might be gone now and there's no teams pressing and different things. Difference is, you've got to remember, this is international football. You can't just sign someone. So you you look at someone like Pep who fell short in a couple of big games because he probably didn't have a striker. He tried to get Harry Kane. That doesn't work. So he just gets Haaland. You can't do that if you're in charge of Spain. Right? So... There, there's diff- you've got to find a way to win with the group of players you have so I think we have to in many ways take this in isolation but there is definitely going to be learnings for certain coaches in it in terms of how not to be beaten again it's it's the very best coaches like J- Jurgen Klopp uh, Mbappe doesn't press for France but if Mbappe had signed for Liverpool a year ago two years ago and he was playing up front with, San, uh, with uh, Mane and Salah he would have bloody pressed so it's 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 coaches make styles and yeah. club football is completely different to to World Cup football. We, we've, uh, we've got your team in the tournament. It'll be very interesting to see if Mbappe stays. That was one of the conversations we were having. If he just decides that actually having the power at PSG is what he wants or if he actually wants to go <laughs> and become the complete footballer. Because I'm not sure that he's going to be driven to become the complete footballer at PSG when... Um, yeah, it's but at the same time, the the difference with, say... Messi is where someone like Mbappe if Mbappe had a bad hamstring injury you, you're not guaranteed he's ever going to come back to be like he's he's world class and he's probably up there with Haaland as the best but because he relies on his pace it's a bit like I'm not going to get into Ronaldo Messi argument here right but but peak Ronaldo I tell you what it's hard to argue he's not better than Messi the difference with Messi's career so he has longevity as he doesn't necessarily rely on his pace and I think Mbappe will fall into that over time it's his pace is that is what's brilliant it's not necessarily it's good movement obviously etc yeah. but pace I, so you, you can't just uh, chalk down that he's going to score 8 goals the next World Cup and 8 goals the World Cup after that and keep going to 35 because no. you know it, well you knew Messi was going to do that back in the day you sort of knew R- peak Ronaldo had a, if, as long as he stays fit and he's he's fit and everyone you knew there was goals in them M- Mbappe so does Mbappe, t- Mbappe's career have a sh- shelf life then we, you can't see Mbappe Poten- in his 30s potentially, potentially. Yeah. and that's the difference I would say between what, what Ronaldo did was he changed into a goal scoring machine a, a, a fox in the box or whatever you want to call it Messi hasn't necessarily changed his game he's just involved and he, he more moments than, than running games so it's it will be interesting to see how, how that one plays out Alright OTB Air brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day the team of the tournament as picked by Vinnie Perth uh, we have Emi Martinez and goals. We have uh, Guardiol and Sice centre backs. You've got uh, Purvis Estupinian. Yeah, that that and that's probably the one where how do you pick a left back? The tournament hasn't been full of left backs. Oh, oh, what I like about Esteban, Esteban, uh, uh, um, he plays with Brighton and he's someone who. I th- I think we've started to see the emergence of him in the last six months in the Premiership, but also at this tournament outside of Hernandez uh, France who had such a poor World, World Cup final and from I, the very start yeah. where the ball just rolls out under his foot yeah. you're like uh oh uh, like, aside from the final he was probably I, I the left back of the going to be a long night yeah, like yeah. we really struggled like if you think about world football and best full backs they're all about probably in the England squad but beyond that we really struggled for good the 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 guy at Dundee United um playing for uh, Australia was excellent but that shows you if you're looking that deep into a tournament yeah. for really good le- uh, left backs you're going to struggle let me do the rest of the team here um, Ashraf Hakimi is your right back you've got Amrabat and Casemiro in midfield Griezmann makes the team Mbappe Messi and Giroud is your striker so um, the ones who didn't make it McAllister Bellingham DePaul Shimeni, any of them close? Yeah, like um, I think I think Fernandez at Argentina is really close. I think he uh, he he was outstanding young player. I think he'll end up in. It looks like there's there's been talk of Liverpool, Bellingham. 
Bellingham was up and down. Like he was, he was brilliant at times. But we, we live, we live in English media world. Like where, um, can I just ask about Declan Rice? Yeah, please, because t- I'm waiting to go on a, a rant on Declan Rice. Well, let, let's let's have it because. Um, I watched the England France game and afterwards like oh Declan Rice what an amazing player he, you know, single-handedly it was like a heroic kind of yeah. you know finger in the dike performance like really was it cuz sometimes when he gets the ball it kind of it comes off his shin a bit and he's reaching for it and all of a sudden the opportunity to slickly move the ball on fast is gone he's a very good defender but is he not like a center back playing midfield well yes the the key to it all is that for the big tactical takeout of Warco for me is the number six position, and there was it, it, people in there didn't dictate games. That's why I put Casemiro in. Thought he was excellent. And remember, Brazil went out to a penalty shootout. Van Dijk went out to a penalty shootout. You know, uh, some of the Portuguese stars went out to a penalty shootout where it could have went or uh, it could have went either way for a lot of stars. This is why the World Cup was brilliant because yeah. we couldn't predict the winner the only thing that was predictable was semi-final but on Declan Rice is a perfect example of of what held for me held England back he didn't he, he, he ran around you want to see his stats they're through the roof but he never like controlled the game he never made a passing where I slightly disagree with you France is the first time in my lifetime I've went right he is a good player because he can lose the odd game at West Ham no pressure no it's not even news it's not headlines he doesn't play that well He's never dictated a top, top game. And he may go on to do that at a maybe United, Chelsea. I think there's huge question marks on uh, Declan Rice. I think, um, is Declan Rice as good as Casemiro, Fernandes at 21, uh, really top class number sixes in the world? I'm not sure. Like, you look at Chiunami, Caravinga, both coming through Real Madrid. Real Madrid aren't getting rid of any of them to sign Declan Rice. But people would tell you he's worth... X amount of money. Um, you look at Fernandinho from Manchester City over the years. All these people control games. He do, he don't do the same as that. I so think. I what, think what impressed you about the France game then? To what what? Oh, I, I just thought it was to be to be fair. It was a game where it was sort of a Premiership type style game where the clash. He won the battles. He I yeah like again. I I thought. Um, Southgate got it wrong if you're going to play Kyle Walker as that deep line midfielder then take out Jordan Henderson who was actually again excellent in the game because of it was it was a premiership style game high intensity and, and say right we need to be brave here and bring a, a Mason Mount or a James a Madison or like the winning of the World Cup for me for England was strangely this is going to make it sound strange was Marcus Rashford I didn't didn't utilise him that, watching that game Marsh Rashford was set up to go and win the game for them but uh, he had the opportunity to do that with, um, and uh, Declan Rice uh, Henderson maybe for an hour excellent kept him in the game battled away with France's midfield France's midfield really strong really good but not brilliant on the ball in any way shape or form don't get me wrong not like well, that's the bit dictating that I think the game in any way a bit like sorry I, I, did, I, I think all the defensive qualities are there but I, I just can't see at the moment the bit where he can become an N'Golo Kante and where you know there's a 10 game stretch where you're like oh this guy's one of the best players in the world yeah. it, it doesn't seem like the ball skills are there No, I think he's being a bit harsh on, on Rice like uh, uh, Ruud Hullett made the point in the last few days that if, if Rice doesn't play for West Ham it helps England like he, he needs to be playing like West Ham is a top level of football it's Premier League level but he needs to be at a top club in order for England to maybe benefit from him more but we need he needs to be at a top club to find out is he's actually good enough Maybe he is, but he, he, the point to make it, if West Ham lose their first game back, I don't know who they're playing, let's say they're playing Southampton away, there's no pressure on Declan Rice, there's no criticism mm. of him, there's no, uh, none of this stuff. He, he, I'll tell you, it's interesting that he hasn't moved to a big club yet. I mean, yeah. you can't tell me, Shane, Manchester United... Because he's so, cause he's so loyal, Vinny. We, we know that Declan Rice is very loyal. But it's yeah. like you can't tell me Manchester United don't have enough money yeah. to buy Declan Rice. Well, they could have just saved the Calvin Phillips money and stumped in a little bit extra. The money they're spending on Casemiro is more than what... Like, well, United, like yeah. at 31 years of age, they've gone and spent uh, for a four or five year deal ma- like three, four hundred thousand pounds a week. Yeah. You can't tell me they, if they wanted him, they risk, couldn't have uh, Casemiro's risk-free. Risk-free? Well, he's not really. I'll tell you what. Well, like he, I wouldn't like to be the financial controller of Manchester United looking at... Ca- ca- risk-free? At 25, well, like, you're going to be giving this guy £400,000 a week. To do a couple of years. Yeah, but he's a five-year deal. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I mean, Casemiro has uh, it took him, a, albeit a, a few weeks, to bed into the United team. But I need all to, of a sudden, we need to get Damien Delaney and to have that one out, which I won't. But you cannot tell me is risk free. 33, 34, 35, you're going to pay £500,000 a week for the guy. Serial winner. But United have the money, as you say. No, and well, yes, and that's, uh, that's the point. Why hasn't he gone for Declan Rice? Well, maybe why, hasn't, why hasn't the top clubs gone from you? Why do you think? Why? I think people aren't sure about him. I'm not sure about the quality on the yeah. ball. I just think that, like... Uh, the Southgate's sure about him. But he's not no choice. I, international football, club football, it keeps saying two different things. I mean, there Adam isn't... Phillips is playing for Man City. He's playing at the top club. Throw yeah, him in. But, but well, Phillips is injured. It'd be interesting to see if he... <clears> it <throat> would have been interesting to see if Phillips had played the whole season and got mm. in the City team is he ahead of Declan Rice. Yeah. Like he, he might not be, but I'm sure there's people thinking that's a nonsense argument, Declan Rice. But I think we may have he may have been overhyped. I think he may have been overhyped as a player. And and listen, time time will tell. I mean, for someone, uh, uh, people don't rate John Stones. I think he's I think he's outstanding. But that's just it. Listen, it's about opinions, and we could be all wrong about these things. But Declan Rice has has far to deceive, and and like so so like let's call a spade. So is this England team. Mm. And whether that's down to the bravery of others and, and, and different bits and pieces, he's part of that problem. Uh, I, I feel they've been too negative and it's, it's cost them the World Cup. Amrabat is probably the prototype of what you need. Like You're, you're talking earlier about the, the, trying not to lose and aiming not to lose a match. Morocco set up so well. Like, and, and I think a lot of teams are going to maybe learn from, from what their manager has done. Yeah, um, I R- think R- so. Gregory was filmed like he was at. I think was it a Zoom conference he did with Mikel Arteta, a coaching conference. Like he, yeah. He's someone who like absolutely sleeps and lives the game, and clear that was quite clear from the Moroccan team the setup. Yeah, I think I I I just think though we all do that now. Yeah, so, like I'm sorry. I mean, I I don't mean like it, Morocco were brilliant. I enjoyed watching them, but I actually got a little bit bored of them, right? Because it's defensive. It's it's and it, like they've won the hearts of so many people in the World Cup, mm. right? Absolutely, and myself included. I know uh, when you listen to Sean in the mornings, Kev loved them. Uh, Cabana can understand that, but like the their manager's not getting the same criticism of other people be, when he changed the shape in the semi final and, and went to a back five, and they 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 cost them. Um, I'm not being critical of of Morocco or the coach. I'm just saying. It's easier to set up as a defensive coach. It's what his problem is that if he had What's to go and win a game, down, down, how did you go and win a game? Yeah. And you've got to go and win tournaments. It's a lot easier to do what he's done. It would be fascinating if he moved to a bigger club where he's expected to win games. It's a lot harder, and, and that's the key to it. Let's talk about Griezmann and Giroud. Why are they in your team? Um, well, well, Griezmann's probably been the player of the tournament, the final of the side. He's been outstanding uh, the way he has played. He has helped this French team in terms of positional sense, his running power, he's, the where he's torn up. He has probably been the player of the tournament without doubt. We'll obviously the Messi lifting the trophy, whatever. He has been outstanding um, his, his gen- turning up. Go back to the game against England, his ball from the left wing where he just turned up in that position. Just an amazing ball. Uh, wins the game for them in the, in, the, in that quarter-final. I thought he was outstanding all tournament long. Um, and, and for me, the best player of the tournament. Giroud, Giroud is one of them where you're scratching your head going, do I put a Neymar in and have a Paris Saint-Germain front three? Do you put... Where is the outstanding centre-forward of the World Cup? Alvarez had a decent tournament for his work rate. Uh, we were expecting Martinez to be the, the main man for Argentina. It didn't didn't play out. So who had a you know like Richarlison was very good. I think it's harsh on Brazil players that you, you sort of look down your nose at them because they went out to a penalty shootout. There hasn't been an outstanding striker. And uh, what what Giroud done was he broke the French all time record. And yeah, he was whipped off early in the, in the final. But over the tournament, he's probably the best striker of the tournament. Uh, would you leave Griezmann on if you know that the game is going to go as long as it's going to go and hope that so you've got as much pace and power as you can get in the team but you still need a little bit of guile and there's a combination there yeah it's I, I just think I, I just think it wasn't his day you know it just wasn't his day and I think as a coach you've, sometimes you've got to recognise that and it's easy to say, oh, that's strange. Taken, and I know we do it with the top players. We leave top players on wait for the big moment, but um, 
I, I, I think he got running power into the team. I think that's what he done. If you actually look where Caravinga came on a left back, it's just about fresh legs, about running power. Shows you they didn't have real strength and depth in that position either. And it's just one of them calls. It's it's no different than I heard talking about horse racing earlier on. Sometimes the best horses just don't turn up. Sometimes the best athletes just don't turn up. And it wasn't his day. Uh, you called it, I think, the best World Cup of your lifetime when we were just before the quarterfinal stage? Early on, yeah. Yeah. In yeah. the shout. You were proven right in the end anyway. Or I was oh, going to ask, have you changed your mind? I, I, I've sort of... I haven't. Cha- I have changed my mind. Yeah, you were. Like, you're like with the indie band, and then everybody gets on board. You're like, no, 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 no. I'm They're sh- no good. They sold out. Hipster. Yeah, it's one of them. I heard Richie McCormick's argument last night. And you were like, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, uh. And I love Richie, but he's he's gone too far to the left. That man, you know. Um, <laughs> that's his. Uh, that definitely is Bo's influence. But then, <laughs> but then you can't come. Uh, it, it's somewhere in the middle. Like that isn't an outstanding team in this World Cup. There isn't an outstanding players in this World Cup. That <laughs> we've lost a huge amount of the world stars have retired, but it was an amazing World Cup. I mean, we go back to Spain and Germany were going out at one stage. It was brilliant that it was only a ten minute window. Yeah, I was like, but it was a World Cup, and I think a few people have made this point. It was a World Cup of brilliant moments, of outstanding moments, and. I don't think football wise it was the best World Cup, but viewing wise it was probably the best one I've seen. That's all that matters, isn't it? Yeah. I do think that it's hard for a World Cup to be truly brilliant anyway anymore. And even even back in the day, I like I didn't I don't remember any of the eighty two World Cup at all. I do remember the eighty six World Cup. There was loads of bad games. Yeah. But like they're they're all blanked because it was Maradona at peak Maradona so whatever happened like it was always great but I mean the England group stage games were all shite yeah. Northern Ireland nil Brazil three not a great game but like no, lo- Josie Mar pings lots one of in from 20 yards done. lots of World Cup have done like exactly 98 was brilliant World Cup but it's because I remember certain things yeah. 2006 was brilliant remember certain things the Bearcam goal you remember that in World Cups but you remember moments this one had a lot more moments I think I think that's why it probably is but I'm a little bit gone. There was a bit of lack of quality at times. Like not to single a player out, and and you look at my team, and we could you could argue over certain positions. Harry Maguire had a good World Cup. So did Otamendi. Like, like Otamendi's won a World Cup, and that's where you've got to remember. Not one of the top ten teams in Europe would sign Otamendi tomorrow. It was free. So it's it's. It, it is what it is. It's it rep- it's world football. Yeah. It represents your country. Yeah. That's why I believe now I've come to the conclusion that your manager should be from your country. That should be a new rule they bring in. And the start. Just, a, just making a rule. Your, yeah, yeah. Your manager has to be from your has to have a passport from your own country. To hell with it and make it a proper World Cup. You're putting yourself forward? No, we already have one there, to be fair. <laughs> <We're okay. laughs> Right, on that note, really great stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks very much. We're live each morning, brought to you by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Back tomorrow morning, the former Irish professional tennis player Jenny Claffey is going to join us to run through her top five tennis moments. It was a crazy 2022 in uh, in the sport. The two lads crying as uh, as Federer retires. Uh, and that wasn't even the, the wildest thing that happened. Um, we'll have Cameron Hill's view uh, review of Connacht's year in rugby. Sinead Kyo will uh, tell us what sports documentaries to watch over Christmas. Right now, we're going to leave you at the best of last night's football show. Here's some Philippe Auclair goodness reflecting on an unforgettable World Cup final. Enjoy and be sure to make your Tuesday better than it has any right to be. This quickly went from not just is this the best World Cup final we've ever seen to is this the best final in the history of football, full stop. Maybe the best game in football, full stop. That's how assured it was instantly of its place as best final. Yeah, and I think, and the only thing that then stops people saying that is they talk about the quality compared to you know the Champions League or Barcelona in, in uh, at their peak with Messi, mm. um, and and those displays of pure beauty and brilliance. They're, they're the, the best displays. Yeah, no, no. But I, the, I, the, what I'm going to say is that I think that isn't that's that's an entirely different thing. Yeah, um, for dr- drama and tension and. And, and plot twists. Yeah. This, this, and everything. And you know, you, you forget, you, like, you forget things like the Martinez save an extra time. Yeah. Which just seems like, oh, yeah, of course he was going to, I didn't, <laughs> going to save that. I didn't appreciate that until I saw the screen grab afterwards because once too much was happening to Ooh. dwell on it. Yeah. And I'm not sure we were ever shown such a 
clear replay and, and too many things happened after and it was quickly forgotten. But then, yeah, when you see the replay, or so when you see the screen grab and he's at full stretch, he's full uh, Schmeichel, star jump. Mm. Uh, I mean, one of a bazillion amazing moments across the whole evening. Filippo Clare is with us. Good evening. Good evening to you. Best World Cup final you've seen? Uh, most uh, riveting from minute 80 onwards. Probably the worst until then because the one team was so much uh, on top of the other. So there wasn't much, there wasn't much, of, much of a match. But what happened afterwards in terms of uh, drama was quite unprecedented. Uh, certainly in the final, not necessarily in the game. I, I, I would think that I can see quite a, quite a few games which were much better in the World Cup history. I can think of uh, Brazil, Italy uh, in 1982. I can think of France, Argentina 1982. She play, I could think of plenty of games in 1982, but as, as far as finals are concerned, in terms of the quality of the football, I have to say it was almost secondary because some of the football was pretty atrocious, to be honest, especially if you were French. And uh, when you see balls like uh, hoofed into touch or just passed into touch, as many as were, it, it was not that great. But in terms of the drama and what happened from minute 80 onwards, it was... Well, I, I haven't quite got over it, and uh, you wouldn't expect that from me anyway. But I, to, if you talk about the football itself, I would say that the, um, uh, and of course that's going back a, a bit, but we have got the images. 1970 World Cup was better. Um, final, that is. Um, but this one had things that no other has had before. And um, in the image of this tournament, which is such an, an ambiguous one, in which we've had so many things to celebrate and so many things to uh, not celebrate. Um, and, and they were coexisting and they coexisted again yesterday. And I suppose this is an image of our world uh, because you you had the Moroccan team going to the semifinals and what style they showed in doing that. Um, you had, of course, the, the Messi story. You have the Bappe story. You could carry on the Australians. Let's not forget them. Who were magnificent. The Japanese... Um, there were so many, so many great stories, but at the same time, it's a World Cup that that remains tainted. And I'm sorry if I put a little bit of a flat on the uh, on the, on the score here, but we shouldn't forget about that either. Um, it was a fantastic World Cup, despite the fact that it was a World Cup. That's the way I would put it. But it was fabulous. And last night, well, last afternoon was just astonishing. Something we will remember for a very, very long time in images that, and it's not just the uh, uh, the, the sore finalist um, who speaks here. Um, there, there were things, I, I still, I'm, I'm still thinking about this save from Wernie, from Martinez. It's like, that probably is the best save I've ever seen in a World Cup. I mean, I think it will be up to the standard of Gordon Banks and Pelé. It's one of those incomprehensible saves. Mm. There's no... How, how does he stop that? I don't understand. Philippe, if we knew we'd be goalkeepers, I have no idea. Uh, so, and, and <laughs> to, to Philippe's point, uh, Dion, again, to take this greatest final that we've ever seen, or one, was certainly one of the great games that we've seen, it is an extraordinary thing that on 62 minutes, the graphic flashed up on the screen. Argentina, 14 attempts on goal, nine off target, five on target. France, zero attempts on goal, full stop. I mean, if you were to oh, say to yeah. somebody, the greatest game of all time is uh, unfolding before your eyes, it's 14 attempts to zero, you'd say, I doubt that. It was like extraordinary. Yeah, it was. Now, I think there was, I. the one thing, I Philippe is right about France's performance up until that point and, and beyond, but I think Argentina were, were exceptional. It wasn't going to be a great final at that point. Uh, but the second goal was was magnificent, and there was and because it was messy, and because of of that, it did still have a kind of uh, a charge. Yes, that if it was just a a, a kind of a pedestrian two 0 victory, it wouldn't have had. But I accept that like that the the transformation, incredible Griezmann, what is it, eleven passes in the first half, Mbappe eleven touches, I think, in the first half, like nothing happening for France. Yeah, um, and for that then to to transform, you know, the, the, the changes Deschamps made being so so critical to that. Um, mm. But it's just, it's, 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 I don't think, just, and, the, and then for it to, to flow and to ebb and flow the way it did after that, um, 
I think, I, I, you know, again, we see so many, like the thing about the, about this final and the thing about this tournament is, is we see a lot of World Cups where there are, are very exciting group stages and then when we get into the knockout stages, the the the, the prospect of elimination and the knowledge that you can just if you cling on to penalties you will have a chance means that a lot of a lot of group a lot of knockout games become quite quite turgid and the final more than any of them but we saw in this competition a number of times really gripping knockout you know, games so for different reasons Netherlands Argentina mm. France England mm. um Argentina, Croatia, you know, in different ways. Like, but but then the, for the final to get into extra time, and have that level of well, we're just going to go for it. Yeah, was mm-hmm. was, was extraordinary. Yeah. I, 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 absolutely. I, I can't remember an extra time that flourished like that, Philippe, with so much at stake. No, I, I, I really can't. It's um, uh, how it happened. Also, when you compare it with. Um, the situation was quite similar to what happened against the Netherlands, wasn't it? When you had a team that was totally out of the game and suddenly found a way back in and you think, oh, what's going to happen? And in the Netherlands-Argentina game, what happened is that everybody went back to square one and thought, we're just going to watch each other for 30 minutes and find out what we are actually uh, like in the, in, the, in the penalty shootout. In this particular case, that was completely different. Argentina reacted and we're actually the first to react in the first period of extra time. And suddenly they found some of the fluency back and then France countered that. And it was the counter was countered and the counter counter was counter counter <laughs> countered. And it went on from there. And then to the, obviously the two players were dominating another three, which is great to say, by the way, I'm not going to mention his name. I'm so happy about that. Um, but the two players, the two most important players in this World Cup suddenly took the stage as well. And 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 that is ra- rather remarkable because suddenly you think, um, I mean, it's obviously, it's a team game and you've got plenty of heroes, inverted commas, you know, McAllister, um, M- Martinez, uh, you could carry on, and Angel Di Maria, who was absolutely magnificent. And on the French side as well, young Colomwani, you know, coming on. Brilliant. And Marcus Turam, he was, they, they were absolutely, and, and, and Deschamps was, for me, had his best game ever as mm-hmm. a French manager. Kingsley Coleman as well, it was an incredible, uh, incredible. Array from and, the bench. and coming back from the vi- coming back, you know, from, from a virus as well, we, we know he wasn't 100%, and there were quite a few others like that, and, and of course, Killian, you know, being reborn. Um, but, then what happened? Yes, was 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 absolutely, absolutely, utterly, utterly crazy. And I think that it shows again that what we love about football is not necessarily, even though we love the technique and everything, and even though I think that Kylian Mbappe's second goal, that volley, is perhaps for me the greatest goal ever scored after Carlos Alberto, perhaps in a World Cup final. Yeah. Are we allowed to say that? No, I, mean, I think I think we are. I think I think we're all hesitant to uh, 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 exclaim at how phenomenal this this was on, on, in in so many different ways because you feel like Ugh. you'd be accused of recency bias. But I, I think you're right. I mean, because we were just saying, well, Liam Brady was on the um, uh, television coverage here at halftime, Philippe, and he was saying, well, I think Argentina's second goal is the best goal I've ever seen in a World Cup final, and it was like Mbappe <laughs> heard him and said, well, have a look at this, buddy. <laughs> yes, well, you, you you can say that. Um, um, in terms of balance, poetry, balletic quality, it was perhaps the most the most astonishing. Um, I, I still think that Carlos Alberto one is will probably never be better. But there you go. I, I'm showing my age, perhaps. But the and, the, uh, car, the Carlos Alberto one, Philippe, was was a kind of coronation, wasn't it? It was the kind of the yeah, the, but that's the, what's the, beautiful. The, it, that, that's why it was beautiful. It was the expression of of the set their celebration and the way art. and Brazil and their art. Whereas whereas yes. the and there was it was the, the 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 kind of the cherry on the on the on the on the cake. Whereas this the second Argentina goal. Was in the middle of the in the, in in of the action, and mm. it was it, it, it was it was decisive, or it appeared to be decisive. And I also yeah, think it, no, it was a thing of beauty. I mean, we we all agree on that, and uh, that 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 cannot be that cannot be doubted. Uh, that the fact it was against the team that had totally lost the plot. Um, suddenly, I mean, maybe you know, my point of view would would not be any perhaps a 
uh, neutral's point of view, uh, because obviously I was quite emotionally invested in that final. But I, I really got the feeling that that kind of goal would never be scored against a proper team, and that France were, were not there, and uh, which was quite shocking. It was looking like a, a team like warming up, uh, being up for it against a, a team that simply had hadn't turned up. But again, what made this game extraordinary is that suddenly, from its vault, uh, suddenly we heard a creak, and um, out of the coffin uh, jumped. <laughs> Kylian Mbappe and and and, the, and and France again and the the dead were undead and the zombies found life mm. and and it was extraordinary and then afterwards I have to say yes the last what is it fifty minutes of the game mm. forty five minutes of the game absolutely extraordinary in terms of emotion again it's proved that you know uh, it, it was a point at which I think uh, tactics had had gone out not just of the window but every possible opening in the house. Uh, nobody knew exactly which position anybody was playing in anymore, and which was wonderful and riotous, and which is one of the reasons perhaps why we could be so emotionally involved in that because we felt probably as we would have felt as as children when we played the game and and when things were going a bit crazy, and all the players becoming a bit crazy and um, losing, trying to preserve some kind of. Uh, of rational approach to the game, I suppose, in some areas, but otherwise totally falling in for, into the chaos and embracing it. And there is nothing, I mean, football is better than any other game um, at embracing chaos. And mm. when it does so, it is absolutely beautiful. And and that's what we saw actually yesterday, which is why, you know, we should, I shouldn't feel sad. I don't feel sad at all about you know, anything that happened. It was quite quite glorious. Oh, as long again, sure. and I, I'm afraid that I, I insist on that, as long as you obviously take the game and um, a, away from what was the frame for, the, for, for well, the game in this competition as a whole, which is a huge problem, which we shouldn't, uh, you one, know, football shouldn't be used to um, to erase that. 100%. Uh, and it was, I, a, I, 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 it I, was a fabulous world goal despite many other yes. things. Well, listen, we'll, and, we, will, and we, we can will... thank the players and the supporters about that. Yeah, rest assured, I'll give you a chance at the end. We will, we will finish on that point, perhaps uh, via discussing the trophy presentation to Messi. We will be the perfect um, well, amongst other things, imagery yes. uh, yeah. to, to encapsulate your point. We will finish on that, absolutely, because I, I, even amidst the madness yesterday, I mean, the context was never very far away. I'll come to Philippe on just what went wrong with France in a moment, Dion, but Argentina, to be fair to them, have grown spectacularly across this tournament from day one against Saudi Arabia to the Mexico game, which was, I know you liked it, but was, you know, a, a fairly appalling game to being, being semi-passable as uh, just Messi and the rest. And it was like, well, are they, all they have is Messi. And then I found myself yesterday watching Enzo Hernandez De Paul was spectacular as well. McAllister, you've both mentioned with Di Maria, this inspired choice on Scaloni's part, and Alvarez, who has exploded into this tournament, and Messi. And I found myself thinking they have gone from being not not very good to completely reliant on Messi to for a portion of that game yesterday. God, they're a bloody good team. Um, yeah. So, 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 told us about Argentina. Why that four three three was so good? Why it all worked? Because they looked like they could give anyone a game for uh, sixty. Eight, nine, seventy minutes yesterday. Well, I think they they did evolve, as you say, and you know you look at Lotaro when he came on um, in the final, and he was doing he was make, missing the same chances. He looked as as clumsy and awkward as he had when he was starting at the beginning of the competition. So Alvarez coming in was a huge development. I think the players found a way of playing around Messi during the tournament, which again is is isn't an unusual thing, like. Philippe will, will remember, like in 1982, Italy started very slowly. Paolo Rossi, yeah, um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it was it was it was against it was against Brazil when he he scored he he finally scored I think, and then he ended up as as top goal scorer mm. and got the golden boot. But it, it it does happen to teams like, and we have we have a, a great um, tendency to kind of judge. And everyone goes into World Cups making predictions and who they fancy, and, and like they kind of they, they they sort of decide those judgments on the basis of the first or second matches. And after the after the Saudi Arabia game, everyone, you know, we were you know we ourselves included when we talked after the Mexico game. So it kind of you know 
that was you know it's nice for Argentina to win, but they aren't they aren't going anywhere in, oh. the, in this competition. But they evolved, and it seems, and this is the other thing, and this seems ridiculous to say given who it is. But Messi got better and better and better, and and like and that is you know from from the highest possible starting point, and some of the the way he played you know we we talked after the Croatia game and 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 what he did to Guardiola in, in that game mm. which was extraordinary and it was a glimpse of 25 year old 26 year old Messi but a guy uh, play, coming up against someone 15 years younger than him and actually humiliating him through his brain through his brain and that's why like his, his hamstring injury didn't matter his hamstring isn't connected to his brain <laughs> and it's extraordinary, and you watch that game yesterday, and every time he gets the ball, I've never... We've all had that feeling with Messi where you gasp. Everyone gasps when he does things. And even even the, that goal, everyone else takes one touch. Messi takes two touches, but they're the, the two of the greatest touches you'll ever see. One to just control it, and then to put that pass mm. around, you know, around, the, around the corner. At high speed. At high speed. Mm. And you're just gasping. But when he gets on the ball, the expectation that something is going to happen now I've never seen it, anyone like it for just it being just and maybe Maradona in 86 in a very different way but just and the way he makes things happen now is a lot more through prompting it's not going to be as many runs and dribbles and beating people but he will do it mm. but it's something is going to happen and the expectation usually is matched by the reality and even if it's just a pass the amount of times he makes a pass that you didn't you didn't see yeah, you didn't imagine, and you suddenly, my God, that's everything has changed from that pass. Mm. So I think he grew into into things as well, which is ridiculous. Saying Messi grew into the tournament is, is kind no, of ridiculous, I, I, but I think you mean. he did actually. He became in sync with that team in a way that wasn't ov- clearly obvious um, at, after at, after the Saudi Arabia game. Philippe, I think uh, a lot of people, myself included would have watched the opening minutes and thought, wow, this is unusual. France, the more experienced of the two teams when it comes to World Cup finals, are the team that are nervous. And then after about 15 minutes, a lot of us would have thought, wow, the French camp had been riddled with COVID and we just haven't heard the full extent of it. That, that, they, they were bereft yeah. of, of energy. That was, I mean, as I was watching the first 20 minutes, I thought, my goodness, uh, this is akin to the All Blacks in South Africa in 1995. This is just a, a dud of a game. and Because they were that bad that something cataclysmic along those lines was the only explanation for how terrible they were right across the pitch, almost. Yeah, um, Deschamps alluded to it. Uh, didn't want to make excuses, which is all to his credit, by the way. But the fact is a number of players looked really under par um, I mean, the, I think Rafael Varane in particular was the shadow of the, the player he'd been before that in the tournament. Not all of them. Upamecano, who had been also fallen to the virus, was probably of the starters, the one who had the better game or the best game of them all. Uh, over 120 minutes, of course. I'm not talking about the last 40 minutes when Kylian Mbappe had a rather better game than almost anybody, actually anybody else on the pitch. Um, but yes, they, they were obviously impaired by that. Um, but again, to Deschamps' credit, he didn't use that as an excuse. Mm. Um, it's it's part of the things that you have to, uh, to deal with in the tournament. It was an unfortunate. It was not the best of preparation for a big final. Um, when it comes to the actual team, the, uh, the experience of the 2018 World Cup, um, I'm sorry, I do not have the numbers at my disposal right now, but there are quite a few players who were just simply were not there. For them, it's almost irrelevant experience. For them, the most recent experience was the complete failure against Switzerland at the Euro, mm. uh, rather than the triumph in, in Moscow in 2018. Uh, but if I can just um, uh, add something for um, for Argentina, uh, they were, by the way, my pre-tournament favourites, and I've got the tweets to prove it, um, because I thought they were the most balanced team, uh, the most balanced version of Argentina we'd seen for a long time. And the extraordinary thing is that they arguably played without their best centre-back yesterday. I mean, everybody would have said Lisandro was the obvious choice for centre-back, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would have thought so. And, and, you, and you see the way that some of the players just grew in, in, into, I mean, not just 
we realized, and they were missing probably the player who'd been the most important in terms of building of the team uh, in the Copa America, which was Lo Celso, was not there, was missing. Mm. And, and, and who had been absolutely key to create this much more balanced Argentinian team. But it, it's not, it's a very, it's, that's why I say it's a different one from the one which won the uh, 1986 World Cup with Maradona, because Maradona had a 